Uh, thank you, and good evening, everybody, to the Cabinet meeting at 7 o'clock on the 7th of July 2021. Uh, because uh, space is limited, um, there is limited space for the present public to physically attend uh, this meeting. Social distancing requirements will be in place. Um, I'd like to thank the BBC for turning up this evening. Um, uh, this is being live streamed uh, and will be available on the Council's webpage channel www.thurrock.gov.uk forward slash webcast. Um, it is quite warm in here, um, so we'll try and be as swift as we can, but whilst giving obviously due diligence to our duties as uh, members. But if it gets too hot, um, those wearing jackets will be able to remove them at their wish. Moving on to item one, apologies for absence. Do we have any apologies for absence, Lucy? No. None. Thank you. Item two, um, to approve the Minister's correct record of the Cabinet uh, meeting held on the 9th of June 2021. Um, are there any statements in relation to uh, the minutes or are they approved? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Items of urgent business, I've received no items of urgent business uh, for today's meeting, uh, although there are two uh, questions from um, backbench members. Um, item four, declarations of interest. Do any members have any declarations of interest in relation to the large number of items that are on the agenda this evening? None? Excellent, thank you. Um, so, uh, my statement. Sorry, uh, Councillor Coxall. Uh, the, my partner may or may not be a later a, a, board, a board member of the Freeport of Brighton. But I don't think it's peculiar in this, but it's just in case. OK, thank you, Councillor Coxall. Um, Monitor officer? Absolutely fine. It's absolutely fine, but thank you for marking that, Councillor Coxall. Um, so, to my uh, statement. Uh, earlier this week, uh, we learned from the Prime Minister that we are extremely likely to move from a position of rules and regulations to one, guidance and to one of guidance and encouragement for people to act with common sense in relation to the COVID pandemic. The rollout of the vaccine has been incredibly successful and the vast majority of adults have had at least one dose uh, and more than 60% of eligible adults in Thurrock have also had both doses. Uh, this has weakened the link between the infection rates and hospitalisations. It will now, or sorry, it will soon be up to us to show um, that we are willing to follow guidance and take uh, the personal responsibility to make sure we are doing all we can to protect each other as we move forward. The number of people testing positive in Thurrock remains relatively low, uh, but despite these numbers, we have uh, seen an increase and would like to continue to do so for a while. We have always known that we would return to a new normal uh, rather than going back to how things were before coronavirus. Um, what will it, that will exactly be, we don't know, and we will obviously wait further guidance. Um, but to give you uh, an idea of the situation in Thurrock, uh, the number of tests in the past seven days is 4,799, uh, which is up from 4,437 the previous week. Uh, under 15s, uh, to, sorry, 15s to 18s, there were uh, 12 positives uh, last week, uh, 60 um, in the age bracket of 18 to 49, two in the age bracket of 50 to 59, uh, one in the age bracket of 60 to 69, and none uh, on uh, the over 70s. All of those are down from the previous week, uh, with the exception of 18 to 49s, which are up slightly. Uh, the 10-day rate per 100,000 is 45.3, up from 41.3 the previous week. And for our upper tier local authority ranking, we are 144th out of 149, compared with 130 out of 149 the previous week. So that shows that we are within the bottom six of the entire country, which is uh, something that we should uh, uh, try to maintain, if not improve upon, as we come out via Freedom Day to uh, the new normal. Uh, on Monday, it was a great privilege to join our Deputy Mayor, Councillor Howden, and staff from the Ambulance Service uh, as he raised the flag uh, at the Civic Offices to mark the 73rd birthday of the NHS. Over the past 16 months, the NHS and uh, the many de dedicated people who work for it have been a big, strong part of the front line in our battle against coronavirus. And it was our honour to mark this birthday, say thank you to all those um, uh, that have really put themselves um, forward during the past 16 months and indeed the past 73 years. Uh, and it was also a great opportunity for me to meet uh, some of the paramedics and ambulance crew that serve Thurrock um, and learn from them some of their 
personal perspectives of what's happened and indeed some of their excellent ideas uh, as we move forward. It was really re quite refreshing. I won't do too much on, on grades because we've got a, quite a heavy agenda, um, uh, which includes quite a lot of the improvements to grades. But it's truly an exciting agenda this evening um, and we will be learning a, a lot more about the progress and what the future holds for Greys. As well as hearing updates on the Towns Fund, uh, which will play a key role in levelling up both Greys and Tilbury, we will discuss the progress on the underpass, which will replace the outdated level crossing and create an entirely new, spectacular looking entrance for Greys High Street. Uh, this was just the latest element in the Greys redevelopment works. Um, it's progressing well, as we know, with the uh, civic offices, the, those that have passed it, you can see it's near complete clad at the front and the subcladding is going on, on the side, so that should be steaming ahead at a good pace. Um, there is also, as we know, the state cinema um, application is now in, which will make it, and I think Councillor Cockshaw will correct me if I'm wrong, the largest High Street Weatherspoons public house in the country. It is. It is. Um, and uh, work will still also uh, begin on the new town centre homes, um, indeed, on this site where we are sitting uh, in the not too distant future. Um, it's only a uh, little over a week ago that I attended the opening of the new rooftop terrace in uh, Feast in Greys, and that really shows that there is a massive buzz um, to move the town centre forward, not just from um, public purse, not just from uh, the council's point of view, but from small, medium enterprises all the way up to very large businesses, uh, which is really great to uh, see. Uh, this Friday, we'll raise a f flag to mark Srebrenica Memorial Week, where we remember the genocide carried out by the Bosnian Serb Nationalist Forces uh, that saw the deaths of more than 8,000 people, mostly Muslim men and boys, in Bosnia-Herzegovina in July 1995. A number of the victims of the internments um, there were flown here for medical treatment, and their wives and children um, also joined them and were resettled in Thurrock. I'm pleased to say that many of the families stayed here and thrived, and now some of those children are now in their 30s or 40s and indeed have children themselves attending uh, thorough schools and taking part in uh, activities across the borough. It is by remembering the victims of the terrible genocides like this that we can resolve that it will never happen again and we need to continue to raise awareness of the need to nurture peace and promote human rights and tolerance across the globe. Moving on to uh, clean at Cusick Fillet, since April 2020, 927 potholes have been filled, with more than 99% of them done in agreed timeframes. 31 fly tips have been cleared, 465 tonnes of waste collected by the streets cleaning and grounds maintenance teams, and six, sorry, 763 fixed penalty notices issued for offences including littering and dropping cigarette butts. Uh, and on a related note, kind of loosely related, um, if any resident is still experiencing missed bin collections, the most effective way that this can be reported to us is via the Thurrock Council website at thurrock.gov.uk forward slash report. This way the report goes straight to the relevant team for action and should it not be picked up at that point, please uh, feel free to put another report in or indeed contact your local councillor. And finally, um, we do wish our wonderful national football team Good luck against um, uh, their match this evening against Denmark. Um, obviously, a number of us are, are doing what we can, as we will be here probably long past the uh, match uh, finish uh, time. Um, so thank members for putting, obviously, residents first rather than uh, watching our national team. Um, as said, there are 23 items on the agenda. We have steamed through a number of them. There are questions from non-exec members. Um, so with that, I am going to move on to item six, which is briefings on policy, budget and other issues. Do any member have any um, briefings on policy, budget and issues? I'm going to go with Councillor Hebb first and then Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Leader. Um, officers have been doing some work to help quantify some of the positive impacts of the UK carbon or on the UK carbon footprint from some of the green energy assets that the council has invested in. Uh, the reason why I bring this up is because being a council which declared a climate emergency for a motion, if I remember correctly, through former Labour councillor Gerrish, I thought it would interest not only just the enthusiasts in the council for a greener nation, but the wider public who are also advocating and calling for public bodies to take a lead on positively reducing carbon in the environment. And it makes for compelling reading. So in terms of the Rockfire portfolio, Thurrock has had it confirmed from external bodies that the portfolio has generated the following positive benefits. The portfolio has produced 516,000 megawatts during 2020. 
That is enough clean energy to power circa 178,000 homes for an entire year. And that's based on Ofgem's typical UK domestic household average annual electricity consumption. For context, that is over double the, property, double the number of properties in the borough. It has avoided 220,000 tonnes of carbon emissions in 2020, and that's based off a comparison to a mix of traditional fossil fuels. That saving equates to circa 71,000 diesel or petrol cars that come in off the road each uh, for an entire year. That is a truly outstanding contribution to the green objectives of our government and to all of us who believe that a greener nation and planet is possible. And while that credit isn't applied to Farrakh, or the carbon credit isn't applied to Farrakh, it's useful to see the positive impact, and myself and Councillor Mays were talking about that earlier. Much has been said by a few that the approach, an approach which was agreed back in members, hasn't worked, or even calling it a failure. Well, on the backdrop of over 100 million earned in interest from investments into green energy markets, making enough green energy to hypothetically supply Farrakh twice over each year, enabling our reserves to increase to up by 300% on the levels that we inherited, funding services above those mandated of the Council, extra police and expanded environmental service, more potholes filled and investment into mental health services. And we're standing at once in a century crisis and still continuing to earn, not lose eight digit incomes, unlike other councils who have suffered after investing in high streets. That is not the mark of a policy which has failed, no. It is the mark of a policy which could have had a different headline, of a council which did something different and it worked. I shall talk more later on the impacts of winding down the investment approach, but for now celebrate the news that what we have done has provided this borough services for a long time, far beyond what is required of a council, and has directly, powerfully and demonstrably helped this nation become a greener one for generations who follow. As and when more interesting information about the positive impacts of, impacts of reducing the nation's carbon footprint emerge, we shall be sure to share them. Uh, thank you, Councillor Hebb. I mean, that really quite impacting. You know, ev every home supplied effectively supplied green energy for two years in one year. Um, or, or the equivalent of nearly every home, if it had a diesel um, powered vehicle, not putting it on the road for a whole year. That's you know, when you start putting it into that kind of context, that's that's really quite impressive, so uh, thank you. Um, Councillor Johnson, you had a, uh, an update too. Yeah, thank you, Leader. I'd just like to say thank you to Councillor Hebb as well. That was a, that's an amazing statement. Um, I'd just like to inform or keep colleagues up to date with a couple of items within my portfolio. Uh, the first being that Thurrock was subject to an Ofsted focused inspection around vulnerable children subject to extra familial harm over the last couple of weeks which both we and Ofsted agree is a very challenging area of work, as sometimes these young people do not even review the, um, view themselves as being as at harm. Whilst we have only received verbal feedback, I am pleased to confirm that it was an overall positive feedback. But I feel a need to remind residents that, as with all Ofsted inspections, there will be what we call learning points, which should not necessarily be looked at as a negative or, or even a failure but as a route to enhance a service that has already moved from requires improvement to good in a very short period of time to outstanding. So I have no doubt that any learning points highlighted in their latest report will be with the intentions to elevate us to an outstanding authority. But we will not receive the draft letter until July the 14th. And once we have responded to that draft letter, the overall published letter from Ofsted will be embargoed by Ofsted until um, early August 2021. Secondly, I'd just like to place on record my thanks to the Conservative Government for agreeing to support free school meals over the summer of 2021 and inform Cabinet that we are currently speaking to our schools about how to best distribute this fund. And I'm pleased to announce that this additional funding plus other fully funded holiday activities in Thurrock, where a meal will be available for eligible children, will ensure that children who qualify for free school meals will be provided for over the summer break as we finally begin to bring the back to life or back to normality after what has been so unprecedented challenging times. Thank you, Leader. And I also wish England good luck. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor uh, Johnson. So moving on to uh, Ed, sorry, any other member wish to add that before I move on? 
No, OK, moving on to item seven, petition submitted by members of the public. Lucy, do we have any petitions? None at all. OK, we now move on to item eight, questions from non-executive members. Now, we normally would take these at the relevant item, uh, but I know Councillor Kent has got, another, uh, has got a question, Councillor Mulgoney has got a question, um, and um, I've agreed for those to be asked today at um, item eight rather than at the relevant one, rather than keeping them all the way through. Uh, the meeting um, here. So, uh, as Councillor Kent's still on his meeting, I have texted him and uh, uh, emailed him to say that it will be a couple of minutes. So, uh, if you'd like to go first, Councillor Muldowney, if you'd like to ask a question to Councillor Coxshall, please. Thank you, Councillor Gledhill. Councillor Coxshall, Chadwell residents have had no opportunity to make their views known to Cabinet ahead of your decision tonight on item 12. Will you agree to consult with local residents before selling off the green fields opposite Cole Avenue? The, the land in question is farmland. I don't know if anyone, anyone here knows or has seen the pictures of it. And it's been offered to sell to a local farmer, and you guessed it, for farming. The land at the moment is being farmed by the same said farmer, and as such has no public access. So it's slightly, it's not the same as any other, other uh, operational item, items or uh, buildings or grounds. But let's be clear, Thurrock Council is not selling this land for development. If the council is selling this land and assets, like in Option 12, we need and do not, do not need or do not need, should own, to invest in small, better services and fewer, newer and fewer buildings. The council should never own like restaurants, pubs and farmland, or anything else that the business that shouldn't provide the core business to residents. Thurrock Council is not a restaurant owner and shouldn't be. The Thurrock Council is not a pub landlord and it shouldn't be a farmer. I am determined to deliver and reinvest the funds that gained out of this to the best possible services, like filling potholes in Chadwell, new plough equipment in Chadwell, parks improved in Chadwell, and a cleaner Chadwell and some new buildings that people deserve to be living in, in Chadwell. And that's what I will continue to do. Thank you, Councillor Coxshall. Uh, Councillor Muldowney, um, in Cabinet, you only get um, one uh, supplementary. Sorry, I probably should have made that clear. You've got a supplementary for Councillor Coxshall. Yes, thank you, Councillor Gedhill. Thank you for your answer, Councillor Coxshall. Um, I'm glad to hear you confirm that this land is not being sold for property development, although obviously once it's out of council hands, that presumably can't be guaranteed. I don't think I heard an answer to my actual question about whether you will consult with local residents um, before selling off this land. I, I repeat again, it's not... The, the, the land, we own loads of issues. You've seen this there. This is land and assets. This is not an operational asset of the council. It is just a land holding you wouldn't have known we own because it's part of the farm. Will you consult? Like, yes they, or they, no? They, they, no, it, it's, 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 go, it's, yeah, it's, it's not consult. It's a, land, a part of the farm. The farmer's had it for gen, a generation or more. Like, it's farmed it. They farmed it for you. They, it is the farmland. It should stay farmland. It's going to stay farmland. And as for your second question, the about whether it comes from Greenbelt, that is your decision at a local plan stage if the Greenbelt removed. That is the decision of all 49 of us that's coming to us in the next two years. It's not my decision. It's not cabinets here. I know if you're still here next year, right, uh, then after you win your election, you will have the opportunity if they ever want to bring for that, but I can catch all you going now. No one has brought that through it on a local plan. You should know that. You should have read your local plan of what, what call for sites are. That Chadwell site, I'm going to inform you, has never come for a call for sites. We've never been interested. No one's ever shown an interest to that, to the call for sites in there. Otherwise, you would have seen it in the call for sites over the last 10 years. So I, I cannot believe you're even asking me this question. It's actually up to you as a councillor in Chadwell to know that. Thank you, Councillor Coxshall. Um, as I say, I have to text Councillor Kent and email Councillor Kent to uh, say that we're at questions. Um, ah. And, and as if by magic, Councillor Kent appears.
Uh, thank you, Councillor Kent. Um, would you like to ask your question as um, emailed uh, earlier this week, please? Th thank you, Chair. Can I start by uh, apologising for, for not being here? I'm at a virtual school uh, governing body meeting, uh, and I'm just, just, just trying to juggle the two. I do not, do, really don't wish to be uh, discourteous. It's just, just the way it's fallen. Uh, so my question is, that back in January 2017, as leader of the council, you said... Central to the future of Greys is the reprovision of a new, modern and fit-for-purpose theatre. You went on to say, to be very clear, the Thameside will remain open until new provision is available. Do you stand by that promise? Uh, thank you, Councillor Kent, and th thank you for joining us. And please don't think it's uh, discourteous. I've fully, as I spoke to you earlier, you know, I fully understand you're on another meeting. You take a short break and then going back to the other meeting. So it's uh, actually good for you to be able to juggle the two. Um, uh, so, as you know, a great deal has happened since 2017. We've gone through a global pandemic that has seen a massive change in the way we interact with each other and enjoy our entertainment, not just now, but probably for years to come. We've moved from overall budget surpluses at the Council, looking to have to make efficiencies and, how we, uh, and change the way we deliver services uh, now and in the future uh, to set a balance MCFS, which we'll see later, um, our ability to invest um, and make those surpluses are outlined have been curtailed. Again, this will come up uh, later in uh, later reports. Um, but we also have a building that is now 50 years old. Um, and as we know, that theatre wasn't up to a standard in 2017, let alone in 2021. What we do have here tonight on the report on item 12 is uh, a report that encompasses the building and the theatre is only part of that building which no longer uh, meets the wider operational needs of the authority. It also could require a substantial capital investment to keep it functioning. Equally, an old, energy inefficient building that's poorly laid out uh, will mean that it will need to undertake a near Herculean task to bring this building into a carbon neutral position as we're required to do so by 2030. Uh, the council's policy uh, is good service delivery and it's not necessarily related to buildings. Uh, indeed, in the last six months, we've demonstrated a huge innovation in the way that we deliver services uh, and they could be provided better um, and deliver stronger outcomes not tied to specific buildings. Over the next few months, uh, the Council will continue to work with the relevant individuals and organisations to promote arts and culture and, uh, in venues across Thurrock. Um, as well as this, we do also to review the service and um, look to um, its current operating model and see where it may need changing. Indeed, I understand that some uh, of the current occupiers and operators from there are already in negotiations uh, with the Council to move to better, more suitable accommodation to provide much better services. Indeed, arts and culture and heritage have uh, always played an important part of the borough and indeed play an important role in economic growth and a place agenda as we move forward. Now, it could be from our conversations that it's deemed um, that having a, a typical small theatre like we see at the Thames side is no longer what we need in the borough. So we might need to look to provide uh, something else. Indeed, we need to be providing what is needed rather than um, uh, what was provided 50 years ago. And indeed, what, what you know, now isn't fit now. It certainly wasn't fit five years ago when we started this review. We will, of course, continue to work with partners to develop the new shared vision of cultural support and re cultural regeneration across Thurrock and not just in the one location of Greys. Sorry, I forgot to... Would you like to ask any supplementary, Councillor Kent? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm grateful for, for the response. Uh, d disappointing, though, I think it was. And I, I think, for me, one of the things we need to understand is that uh, the Thameside complex is much more than the sum of its parts. And it is important that you have a home for arts, culture and heritage somewhere in the borough that brings that kind of synergy of the library, the museum, the theatre, the music studio, everything else that goes on in that building uh, together. That gives you uh, some impetus, it gives energy, it gives a critical mass that will be lost if we start to strip the component parts out and put a library here, a museum there, a theatre somewhere else. I think that capacity and critical mass is really important. Personally, I'm really not wedded to, to the idea that the Thameside, the Thameside complex has to be owned and has to be run and operated by the local authority. So my question is, can I ask that Cabinet leaves no stone unturned in looking for other ways to keep the Thameside going? 
perhaps by working with arts organisations, maybe inside the borough or outside the borough, or even helping to foster some sort of community enterprise that could take on the building, give the Thameside a new lease of life, and give it hope into the future. Uh, thank you, Councillor Kent. Um, and I would ask where you get your crystal ball from, because pretty much that's <laughs> you've stolen Councillor Coxwell's um, uh, statement from um, his <laughs> from uh, item 12 later on. Um, that, that's one of the many things that we are doing. That there are already conversations uh, going on at a lower level, not just with the arts um, uh, people that are in there, but you know those across the borough. Um, we're part of the the, the whole of the southeast, um, uh, not production corridor, but the um, uh, well, what's it called? Can't they? What the name of the corridor is, Mark? Corridor. Sorry. Oh, it's the production corridor. Yes. So, um, you know, it's not just Thurrock, but there's a much wider agenda here right across the southeast. Um, and yes, we are already, as I say, in light conversations uh, with uh, organisations that may well be able to do this um, without any support from the council, and indeed reshape it, reform it, and make it a centre uh, for uh, arts and heritage. Uh, all in one place actually works for 2021 plus rather than 1971 plus. Thank you. With that, I will take my leave and I think you'll be finished much earlier than I will. I do not envy your task, uh, Councillor Kent, uh, and thank you both for uh, turning up. I'll just allow a minute for um, members to, to leave. I feel a little bit like the speaker now. Uh, so, uh, thank you, members. So, um, back to uh, the agenda. Um, uh, item nine, matters referred to Cabinet for consideration by overview and scrutiny. Um, I do have the Chair of Overview, uh, sorry, for uh, Planning, Transport and Regeneration uh, for item 23, I believe. Uh, are there any other updates? Um, no, none? Excellent, thank you. Uh, moving on to uh, item 10, uh, Lower Thames Crossing Task Force update. That can be found at pages 11 to 14 on your agenda, and I pass over to Councillor Massey. Councillor Massey, would like to introduce and deliver your report. Thank you, Chair, and good evening, Cabinet. This is a brief report detailing February and March task force meetings. Um, with recent announcements, Cabinet can expect far more to report in the future due to Highways England launching a new community impact consultation later this month. In February, the task force was given a detailed presentation from Highways England this included green infrastructure, biodiversity, woodland and tree planting, and although some of the task force members had concerns in regards to the scale and scope of the proposals, it was really pleasing to see new higher levels of detail coming from Highways England. HE also presented on the public rights of way, footpaths, cycle routes and bridleways. Highways England stated a total of 22.1 kilometres of new or upgraded routes would be proposed for Thurrock. The question was raised if any of these new routes were going to be available to residents before completion of the project. Uh, the answer is still um, ongoing works regarding the construction phase, but they would endeavour to open routes as safe and as reasonably safe, sound to do so. Overall, a very detailed presentation. I would urge councillors to view the presentation online to see how wards in Thurrock would be affected. February also included a summary of the energy white paper, although this, some of these information did not directly affect the LTC. The task force did discuss how the changes to homes are heated in the future and the rollout of electric vehicles and associated charging networks may have an impact. Finally, the Hatch report mitigation was discussed. Some as aspects of this seem easier to achieve than others and discussions continue with Highways England in regards to many points of this report. Moving on to March's meeting, uh, this was the last one of the new municipal year and three technical page, uh, papers were presented an environmental impact assessment update, a health impact assessment, and a CO2 emissions um, report, and many te technical questions were answered. It was reported that Highways England um, were currently re revising the environmental impact assessment, and Farrock had made comments, and after Highways England response, the Farrock LTC team 
um, are still comparing the impact assessment, so that included of the development consent order version one that was submitted by Highways England. The task force did discuss the use of the River Thames to alleviate construction traffic on Thurrock roads, along with tree planting and air quality in general. The health impact update was presented, um, Highways England responses again being compared to those submitted to the LTC development consent order version one. Although progress is being made, Thurrock still has concerns regarding the elements of the baseline data, methodology, the results and mitigation. For example, air quality data, access to open spaces and noise and vibration levels. Work is ongoing to combine and compare the data to understand the remaining issues. Finally for March, CO2 emissions in general and in regards to the mitigation hatch report were discussed. The two main mitigation measures including ultra low emission vehicle targets on the LTC and the carbon offsetting plan through the introduction of willow tree planting. The Department of Transport decarbonisation plan was discussed with the final report being due later in 2021 from that department. Uh, work regarding the report and mitigation is still ongoing. To sum up, I'd like to remind everyone that the latest Highways England consultation impact assessment begins on the 14th of July and runs until the 8th of September. This looks to be delivered in a range of ways to access information, including a dedicated website, webinars and a telephone service. If guidance permits, Highways England will also host a series of in-person events at locations along the proposed route. A range of documents will be published alongside new visualisations and fly-through videos to give an overview of the route before, during and after it is built. I have had recent meetings with Thurrock Senior LTC officers ahead of the next meeting of Task Force, which is the Monday the 12th of July, where Highways England will be attended. That concludes this report of the Cabinet of the Lower Thames Crossing Task Force. Thank you, Councillor Massey. Um, Councillor Coxall, number of questions. Thank you. That was a very full front report and very helpful, I think, to our Cabinet colleagues. As a, an, it, it's an ongoing issue for many years now, and it will be an issue for many years to come, especially as the construction traffic is the biggest issue that I see immediately affecting us and affecting the issues. But I am... I've had numerous meetings with Highways England over the monthly meetings, me and the self and the leader, and uh, we felt that there's been a sea change since the management changes of that. And I don't know if you've had felt the same or uh, the Highways England, and, and how would you see that Highways England have, in this consultation of, uh, coming up have been very helpful to, definitely to me and the leader, other than that press release of a Brentwood forest was going to help us, and a Brentwood forest isn't going to help the people of Thurrock. We want a forest in Thurrock as part of the mitigation, and... And I, I wanted to know see how you get on with, with the new Highways England management structure. Thank you, Councillor Cockshaw. I echo your words on the, on the forest. And yes, we'd like to see, obviously, much more along the actual route and communities affected. But in terms of um, Highways England engagement, it has been um, a definite change. Um, far more engaging. The levels of report we're receiving now at Task Force are a lot more detail. The sort of things we were, were asking for 18 months ago and are now actually been presented to us and, and they've been very uh, forthright in answering questions both in meetings and offline. Um, so yes, it's, it's a far more improvement. Uh, thank you. Uh, any other questions for Councillor Massey? No? Okay, um, only one thing to add. Uh, Lucy, can we make sure there is a link in the Cabinet Minutes to the L uh, LTC um, uh, meeting just so that there's a bit of a flow there so if they can't find it for one route they can find it for a second route it certainly sounds like it's, it's moving on at a pace uh, which is good um, especially with the like the hatch mitigation reports and, and, and so on uh, which is um, uh, really good and as Council, I'm going to echo what Council Cultural said yeah we, we've gone through several iterations of management in relation to the LTC but they seem to have actually you know got it right or certainly if they're not got it right they, they are working very hard to get it 100% it's been a complete, it's just like, wow, is this the same, you know, <laughs> this is the same organisation. So, yeah, it's absolutely fantastic. I'm glad that's been experienced, not just by Councillor Cox and I, but indeed by yourself and the, uh, and the committee, uh, sorry, the task force. Um, so with that, if there's nothing else to add, members, um, there is a recommendation on page 11, uh, which is Cabinet notes the work of the task force. Is that duly noted? Yeah, Excellent, thank you. And as always, Councillor Massey, it's always a pleasure to see you here. Um, and look forward to uh, seeing you again as we go through um, uh, the uh, delivery of the LTC or whatever happens with it. Thank you. You can stay, of course, if you wish. I'm sure there's nothing else you'd <laughs> rather be doing at 25 to 8. Come on, England. <laughs>
Councillor Hebb's got like 10 pages of speeches yeah. at 12 points. So, you know, this, this is going to be interesting. So uh, moving on to uh, item 11, which is at page 15, which is the 2020-21 financial outturn report, which is a report Councillor Hebb. Councillor Hebb. Thank you, Leader. Uh, 2020 was clearly a year like no other. A uh, once in a century adult centric health crisis changed everything at the turn of the switch. And whilst the long term effects of health and the economy can never, re, um, uh, can never be reset, obviously, back to its original position overnight. But this report is what I've always called a rear view mirror look. This is a report that looks not necessarily at the future, but the year that has just gone. And despite the pandemic, Farrah Council was able to balance its budget. How, you may ask? Well, unprecedented financial support from the Conservative government to the tune of £14 million, or over, actually. A reserves position that had been increased by 300% of 2016 levels. The backdrop of 100 million, over £100 million, sorry, earned in interest from investments into green energy markets, whilst reducing carbon, like we talked earlier, with solar and wind farms performing very strongly, even 15 months after the crisis took hold. COVID has caused some councils to use most of its reserves, and has seen their investment performance run a deficit, not a profit. It has been a difficult year, and there are those that have sunk. But there are also those that have kept their ship afloat. Perhaps more withered and battle damage, yes. But the ship, Farrock, returned to port intact and is ready to sail. Farrock is not one of those councils unable to do that. Absolutely not. It is certainly not a council like Croydon or Slough, the latter who has depleted its reserves position years ahead of the pandemics um, due to years of financial uh, management issues, something we are not or haven't done. And unlike others, we deliberately strayed away, Leader, from property investment, which has seen other councils' investment portfolios returns plummet. The council has spent more than £14.8 million protecting our vulnerable. Vulnerable residents were able to rely on Furrock Council during this health crisis. And I want to levy my thanks to officials in this council and the partners to whom we have worked with in the private and voluntary sector who helped secure the ability to serve those who needed us most. The government's allocation of 14.242 million helped us bridge gaps from income streams from services which charge, such as registry services and so forth, as well as fund overspends critical to the local effort in providing the vulnerable the care that they needed, uh, such as resilience payments into the adult care market. Our general reserves remain untouched. Wider reserves remain nearly 260% of the levels we inherited in 2016. And our investments continue to earn seven to eight digit income to fund services that residents have wanted or needed over the last 12 months. Each department has played its part and I want to pay particular tribute to the social care and public health functions for what they faced and overcome, along with departments that also supported the common cause, such as communities, the environment, highways, and so many more. I'm not always the best at recognising performance. Often I default to what we need to focus on that hasn't gone so well. But I do also want to be very vocal in my thanks personally to the Finance Department, who skillfully, dutifully and speedily got grant funding to vulnerable residents and enterprise in rapid fashion. I saw firsthand the efforts my department went to, to do the right thing at the speed that they did, consuming weekends to make magic happen. The work that the department have done has meant that businesses and households could survive. And we owe the department thanks for working at haste and with accuracy to the people that we've helped. In terms of capital leader, the council still spent £92 million on capital projects. And whilst their capital project list is now smaller, there are still £200 million worth of exciting capital projects ahead. This administration has set its sights on building an approach to answer the age-old Farrock question around traffic uh, leaving Lakeside. And the ambition of the administration is to develop concepts to deburden communities in West Farrock, Chafford and Greys of traffic departing Lakeside and making trips home for people on the east side of the borough um, easier, uh, which is more attractive to not only the, the people in the east of the borough, but the wider borough as well, um, outside of the borough as well. The task ahead is large. The 30 million deficits are not something, uh, are something that, sorry, that has been confronted before. But the options that were once there are simply there no longer. I will address that later. But for now, let us recognise, pay thanks to staff inside this authority and to those to whom we have worked with alongside 
for keeping the ship afloat, helping our most vulnerable in their greatest time of need, and getting the ship dock ready for the next journey. Happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Councillor Hebb. Uh, members, have you got any questions or statements in relation to Councillor Hebb's report? No. I mean, as Councillor Hebb said, is, this is the backward-looking report. It's what, what, what we did well and what we didn't do well last year, or in our case, what we did really well and what we did well last year. Um, uh, I don't think we could ever thank officers and volunteers enough for the amount of work they put in front end of the pandemic, middle end of the pandemic, and hopefully towards the end of the pandemic. Um, you know, we see uh, 14.242 million uh, that was gifted to us by government. That wasn't what we spent. We spent more. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you uh, an example. At the time when government were trying to um, organise uh, food parcels for those that were category one at the time uh, vulnerable, um, staff here managed to secure goods to ensure that every person on that list got a food parcel. Indeed, those that weren't on the list but were added to the list later, I think in one case, I think it was under four hours before um, it being reported to us before they had that in their hands and we're extremely grateful because it was a di difference between surviving and thriving, as uh, Councillor Hebb would like to say. Um, it was you know, uh, really welcomed by, by that individual. And indeed, a number of people since stopped me on the, on the streets, as, as people tend to do, um, to say thank you for you know, helping their uh, you know, older mother, their older relatives, their, their neighbours, or indeed them themselves, saying it was really great. If we hadn't got that, we wouldn't have had tea bags. We wouldn't have had, you know, just those basic things we all take for granted. Um, just a very small, you know, amount of money in the grand scheme of things, but uh, instant response, instant um, uh, addressed, and instantly delivered. Um, indeed, I think they were all delivered before uh, the government replaced everything for the next one. So, you know, it's a it hats off just on that one little thing. Uh, and there are many others. And, and, spending that I'd rather not go into because it's too distressing to th even think about what we, uh, the discussions Lynn and I had to have last year on, you know, are we going to spend money on this? Are we going to spend money on that? And it wasn't, are we going to spend money on this or that? It was, are we going to spend this much money on this? And are we going to spend this much money on that? Um, it was a, yeah, um, not a particularly pleasant time for all of us, but it's good to see not only did we get through it, we also excelled at getting the grants out. Indeed, I spoke to the head of service today. This is the last lot of grants that they're, they're, they're trying to thrash out as we speak uh, to make sure that we transition from where we are now, going past Freedom Day, um, and then on to the new, new norm um, as, we, as we move into the year. So with nothing else, uh, no other questions or statements, I'm going to move to page 16. There are recommendations at 1.1 1 .1 and 1 1.2. I don't intend to read them out to reduce... Oh, and 1.3, sorry, to reduce the time. So uh, are they agreed? Excellent. Thank you all. Now moving on to um, uh, item 12, um, which is uh, Council Coxall and the Asset Review and Disposal uh, Report. Council Coxall. Thank you very much. I know we've been mentioned a couple of times already tonight, um, but we can actually have a wider conversation instead of the items here. Uh, this goes back a long way from when I first um, was asked by the leader to look at assets in 2017. And we I mentioned it a few times at full councils, so or the three R's, which is release, retain, and reuse. We need to actually make sure that the assets we have, we have to retain are as small as possible, as much as we get a maximum benefit to the services that are inside these buildings. It's not about buildings and owning things and being glorious about buildings and land. It's about delivering services. And services is the most important thing. It's not that what's, whether, whether we, where we are working or where the officers are working. And it must be a reasonably good quality building that the officers are working for us day in, day out. With that comment, the, 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 when we go to this, there's also an issue that's around this that's always concerned me is transparency. Transparency is the most important thing of this as we move forward and selling assets. You always hear this, that, that assets are um, backroom deals, private deals. That will not happen here. What this is, is we first offer to the tenants, that, um, if there is a tenant or landlord or in the issue who's there, whose asset we are owning. If not, it will go with conversations with the neighbour and then we go to open market. And if there's any interest, if anyone's shown an interest here, that will be put out transparently as well of interest in these sites. So that I, I've not been shown that I've talked to anyone or got anyone inside deal, you can't talk to me and then you get a special deal, you don't. You don't get that from our office, you don't get that from here. We never, ever want to see, under my watch, 
a, a, a Stanford King Street car park again. The disgrace of that was the driving force between this. There's assets here. We all know there's assets across the borough. And we must not ever see a King Street, which is undersold, not transparent, dropped straight through, plan permission put on somebody else doing it. We can't have that ever again. Well, going on to that, what we need to do is move forward is for decades we've had about poor, knackered buildings. And what we need to say, and we've seen this now, we've seen this in the, uh, in the brand new building which we're collecting now, and the history and the complaints we had about that, that our, our brand new council offices. That council, pre there was a thousand people in this building, we're now trying to get 450 people, and that means we don't need this building we're sitting in now. This always about that is producing the size of the buildings and getting better out of the buildings we're using and better quality. And, as you've the, my councillor Hebb has just mentioned tonight, a good carbon neutral agenda. Let's make sure these buildings are carbon zero, that we're building forward and making carbon neutral inside there. And if you look at the Thames side, it's not possible, and there's many buildings like that. We know what we need to do is get better buildings for people to be living and working in. And so that's where I move that the item tonight, we've got to reinvest this money. This is not about, have you heard, about a sale, fire sales or anything like that. This is about using the right buildings at the right time and getting the money back into services, get money back into the services, get money better thing. We need to do, we've got to relook at it after we've had a fantastic vision and bits of pieces and it's now come to the time, but this was in skated, sir, 2017. We're now coming to the end of that and making sure we've got a full asset list. And I must thank um, Lynn for all the hard work on this and on the other tech asset team that for three years, driving this forward and making sure we can realise the three R's and it's fantastic we see it tonight. It's not a negative, it's a positive because this money will come back and reinvest into the community. We're going to do things differently but we, there's still, the services are still here. Uh, thank you, Councillor Cochran. Um, has any member got any uh, questions in relation to this? Uh, uh, Councillor Hewling. My question, more of a statement because of what's been going on, but this paper is all about reviewing buildings no longer fit for purpose in a modern world and not about the services operating in them, as Mark said. For example, 6.62 Coronway Depot, the building is no longer economically viable. The repairs to the building cost more than the hot meal delivery service done from the building. It's a no-brainer. We will still make and deliver hot meals that are vital to uh, some of our residents, but via another building that um, is fit for purpose, allowing us to improve services and outcomes. Likewise, with the Thames side, it's the building that is unfit for purpose, not the services, and we want to be able to focus on the services and better outcomes, not spending millions on propping up a building that doesn't work properly. Um, even Councillor Kent's own Thameside working report all those years ago showed that. So Thurrock Arts, Education and Culture Offer didn't stop because the Thameside was out of bounds during COVID. Quite the opposite, in fact. Very quickly, an interactive website was born and the theatre team have actively created Thameside to You, which is about taking performing arts out into the borough. Council works closely with the Creative People and Places team and we recognise the vital work that they've done in preparing a bid for funding to the Arts Council and we fully support the work being done here because it rightly focuses on engaging communities in arts and culture and we recognise the significance it has on our health and wellbeing, especially in times as hard as these with many isolating for over a year. We recognise COVID has changed us, it, our audience has changed too, and the way they want to engage has changed and we have so many ways and opportunities to take the arts into communities. High house production facilities, a walled garden, an amphitheatre in greys, a vast array of community venues with stages, civic halls, schools and college auditoriums. The cruise terminal, we can have live performances, we can have streaming technology, we can have travelling shows and exhibitions. We've talked to creative people and places and they don't feel that our arts offer and community engagement is limited to a building and neither do we. This is why we'll bring a paper forward with proposals, ideas and options for a more robust, exciting and sustainable service offer which, with choices and options to be discussed cross-party based on the visions and priorities of the invaluable community engagement carried out by CPP so that ultimately we can build a strategy together for modern arts and culture offer. I really value this generation report 
because we, like Councillor Kent, want open and transparent conversations, giving community groups the potential for ownership of the borough's offer and helping us rebuild a better offer. This is exciting times. And finally, Labour agrees with Cabinet, which is amazing. <laughs> oh, I think you might have stolen Councillor Cockshaw's thunder there. Councillor Cockshaw. Yeah, that was fantastic, and it's a good thing. I, we're missing, and anyone I'm sure is going to turn off in a shortly time. So, I, my next item, because I've got quite a few items on this, is talking about the reinvestment and about the Tilbury town, the, Til the town's funds, and the Tilbury and Grace funds. And this is, and I may be people have called me anti arts and culture and all sorts of things and anti sport. Well, maybe I am, <laughs> but <laughs> but I do understand and I do see that, and I just think we've, what we've got here as an opportunity to reshape. And I think I'm afraid that this asset paper's come forward because that can start this conversation. And I think this conversation needs to be had for five, six, eight years we've just heard. There's people dodging this conversation. It's been a conversation privately in this building. Let's put it out there, let's have that conversation. We're not scared to take the hits, and I certainly aren't, that because at the end of it, I can see at the end of it, we'll have a better arts offering and cultural offering in this borough. Because we've the three words that I work to every day is, is this work, live and play? We've got to deliver somewhere we've worked really good to work, that's on here tonight, somewhere we can relive, and that's the housing paper we're going to talk about, and somewhere to play, and the play is the important part, and culture and arts is important part of that culture, otherwise we can't people want people to live here. And that's saying that I see that we've got somewhere already, and I was t can I answer about John Councillor Kent's comments about uh, the Thames side? There is a cultural hub here. We had a cultural hub, and that was the 2012 dividend from moving to Royal Opera House here. We've got, I used to live on that hub, a cultural hub here, and we're not making the best of it. I speak to leaders uh, through CELEP, and they say, why aren't we, was we last week in Kent, why aren't we back in the Perth Fleet in that cultural hub? It was fantastic. The sandwiches were nice as well. They were, they were there. <laughs> you know, but they were really important area. We need to bring that cultural hub to a life more. And Perth Fleet is our cultural hub. The Greys will be our leisure and entertainment hub and enjoy that with the sports in the great around Greys and the, and the front. And then we have our heritage, the really important heritage, going back to Queen Elizabeth I in St Tilbury. That is what we want a vision for and that's what we're going to aim to do. And with this cabinet hoping coming tonight, we're going to see that great delivery. And of course our free port, just to throw it around. <laughs> I wouldn't leave you out, don't worry. Uh, SS17 councillors. Um, the only thing I think you may have missed in your presentation, uh, Councillor Cockshall, was the um, obviously uh, the community aspect of this. You know, obviously, it goes to the owner and so on. But if there's a community interest and it passes community interest test, and the community can um, uh, acquire that um, asset, um, then they are perfectly entitled to uh, make a bid uh, under the. Um, I think it was uh, Lord Pickles as he is now uh, under his um, uh, the changes of the regulations back in 2010, 2011. Yes, that was changed by our predecessor, Councillor uh, Haig, um, for many years ago that, that that was brought in and I, I completely forgot that. So Councillor Haig to make sure that but we haven't had, we need community assets and as we go forward this asset disposal paper, as it comes forward to community assets, we will bring that forward at a faster rate and hopefully communities can get involved. Maybe the Thames side is the first one we can actually deliver to after your comments between the two leaders, the groups. Fantastic. Yeah, you, you're... Um Absolutely right. Any other member got any statements or questions in relation to uh, the report? Um, Councillor Spillman. I just want to say that the way that this has been reported in the press is not a fair reflection on what's been going on behind the scenes. And I'm glad that Councillor Kent asked that question tonight because it gave the council an um, opportunity to say that everything is still on the table and that we're discussing things with community groups. Because, I mean, I wrote many years ago about the, you know, the path that Gray's High Street was taking, and I called for a vision for, you know, an arts, culture, leisure zone in council, uh, in Gray's town centre, because I didn't think that the, you know, that, the, um, that, that the shops could withstand the pressure from Lakeside, and we needed to change Gray's. And what I am really excited about is that, that vision is taking shape and we're seeing quite a lot of that. And, uh, and my point when we spoke about this was between the scenes was when the disposal of Thameside um, came up was, is this still a conversation or is this just us shutting down and demolishing the theatre? And it's very important that the wider public and, and the media understand that this is, this is about starting a wider conversation 
about what we're delivering. It's not just about saying, we're just disposing of this, we're just getting rid of it. And that's how it's been reported and it's not reflective of what's going on behind the scenes. And I think a lot of people that are worried and, and I've got, you know, people, a lot of people are signing a petition, a lot of people are worried. Well, they, they don't need to worry, yeah, because these conversations are going ahead. Uh, and this is, this is about developing a much, much better offering. And as we see from the, the I mean, some of the plans that we've got, um, I mean, regarding the grey seafront and how that is going to drive arts, culture and leisure in this high street. It is so exciting. Um, we're talking about, you know, real game changers here. And if we can bring all them together, they just will, they will just benefit each other and spiral and spiral and spiral. And we'll have people come in here rather than going a little bit further down the coast to spend their hard-earned cash from London. And that's when you get great new restaurants, great new clubs, great new bars, you know, great new, you know, cultural and heritage offerings. And that's what we're trying to do. And personally, I think it's really, really exciting. Uh, yes, you're absolutely. It's Councillor Cockshaw. I can echo that. And it's, it is about reinvesting this. And it's a, it's a horrible paper. And there's only there's 33 sites. But it's, this is not, this is the beginning of a project of, of thir a few more each time over the next few years of, of that. And the one you mentioned, we keep mentioning Thameside, it's mentioned now for that conversation to start that we need another conversation to get it out in the public and be transparent about it. It's not tonight being voted on to put it onto the re remote uh, set for sale list. It's not. It's a conversation starter. And it's not on the 33 uh, are there, but it is in the paper. And it's in the right place to be in the paper because nothing's off the table. Right? And then we start with the three, the three R's and then we start at that conversation. And that's what we should be doing. And that's why it is great. And it is about reinvesting. It's about what, what Grays should look like. And then we see before the media disappear, like you can look at Grays. We've got that beach. We've got a brand new riverfront. And I want to see loads of great stuff in there. I want to see new buildings at the, on the riverfront. We've got an opportunity in Kilburg for other colleagues in a regeneration in Basildon. So it's not the Basildon regeneration is amazing. But we've got an opportunity. We're on the river. We're on this river, and we need to start looking instead of into the river and not away from that. And that's where the culture and arts should be sitting, on that river. Thank you, Councillor Coxshaw. You're quite right. And actually, Councillor Julian uh, actually did it quite well earlier and said that you know, it's really good to see the Leader of the Opposition agreeing with the Cabinet. Um, and you know, again, with Councillor Spielman, you know, obviously all it took for you was to actually join us to make this happen. So, well done. Thank you very much. Um, it's not just yourself, of course, um, but uh, let, let's be realistic about this. This is um, this is a long time coming. Um, I can remember when we had the then Secretary of State in um, Greys um, about something that was going to come to later, which is the underpass, and we were discussing uh, with our MP, Jackie Dell Price, at the time, the high, tr high street will need to change. It will need to be something else. Well, OK, we've got Feast. I know we can you know, mention the Feast. It's, you know, it's the one. Um, that start, made that catalytic start and everybody else is starting to sort of say, well, actually, how can we do this? What can we do? What can, how can the council help us to make our restaurants outside and, and, and so on, which is really great. Who would have ever expected that to happen? Um, but that's happening because of the investment. And obviously, if we get back to, if you're going to have the investment, you have to have that serious conversation about what do we need? Do we need Indian restaurants that used to be public toilets? Do we need... Other properties that you, know, you just look at it and you think it's, it's archaic that local authorities own them. I, I remember year one of me being a councillor, one of our policy assistants said, yep, we've finally got the assets register done. I can assure you it was smaller than the, the report we've got here tonight about the assets that we're disposing. Um, OK, it wasn't full of pictures, but it was, it's nowhere near what we now know. So this is a great bit of work um, that's been done. So thanks to officers for really digging in deep on this and really finding out some very odd things that we own. Um, <laughs> um, and, you know, we now need to look at that, as Councillor Coxwell says, indeed the paper says, you know, we shouldn't be keeping them if we don't need them. Um, we shouldn't be keeping them if they're not making us a massive amount of income. Um, so, yes, it is difficult. Yes, it's not been reported or indeed taken up um, in a certain way. There does seem to be a negative. Whatever any local authority does is always wrong. Uh, actually, no, this is right. There needs to be the understanding that this is not just, OK, thank you very much, I'm going to go around with a padlock and chain, you know, lock up the uh, Thames side and that's the last anything will ever happen. We don't do that. It's open, it's transparent, and as Councillor Coxwell said, you know, this is not just about selling to rebuild, 
This is about making sure the community are involved, making sure that it's the right thing in the right place, that businesses can continue to work. Farmers can continue to farm. Um, you know, I, I, I know it's not the only one that we have. Um, so, yeah. So, I, I'm going to move to the um, recommendations uh, 1.1 to 1.3 at page 34. Again, I'm not going to read them all. I'm sure we can. Um, are they all agreed? Agreed. agreed. Excellent. Moving on to... Uh, the Capital Programme, page 51, that's Councillor Hebb. Thank you, Leader. We, we now turn to the uh, Forward Capital Plan. Uh, I announced last year that Cap and it instructed and presided a review over the Capital Programme. Uh, you know, like households across the country struggling, projects which were yet to start that might be able to be put off until income was more certain would either be deferred or, or cancelled altogether. So that resulted in the equivalent of £19 million worth of reductions to the Capital Plan and another 12 million being deferred to another day. Now, there are obviously corporate benefits of capital uh, project reductions, notably the MRP requirements will reduce, and therefore revenue contributions uh, to financing capital projects will reduce. Um, and that we could take the moment to assess how COVID has impacted our plans and determine, uh, I suppose, a, a post-pandemic outlook on, on what was a priority and how we deliver that. Um, there were a number of things that were simply nice to have, um, and there are things that could probably last that while longer, um, that would simply need to last that bit longer. But even with the changes to the plans, we have a really exciting, uh, ambitious agenda ahead, um, not least of all because of the quarter billion pound um, capital agenda, and that's without me even addressing the Freeport uh, investment, which will hopefully begin to come on stream towards the end of the year. Uh, which will see even more unparalleled investment in infrastructure and connectivity than you know anyone could ever have believed and certainly when you know we moved here in 1995 i mean i've ever believed a government would put so much into the community i moved into i it's, it's purely staggering but taking stock of the priorities there are two projects that this cabinet have reviewed along with officers and we've determined need further prioritization here and now for the right reasons so the Grey South project and underpass is a critical part, as, as colleagues around the table have said, a critical part of the plan to transform and elevate, I think is probably a good word, um, to Grey's. A budget was forecast on the conceptual designs and a review of the plan ahead of execution has identified the need for further investment into that programme. So this authority or this paper rather is seeking to play out £11 million more into that project to make sure that this project realises the ambitions of all residents and businesses and organisations who want to make Greys a great place of home, work and play. There remains more to do with Network Rail, um, but this indicates a solid commitment from an administration who believes that Farrakh and Greys can work better for its residents and businesses and perhaps explain some of the reasons why notoriously safe Labour seats are moving to blue Conservative seats as recently as two months ago in Chadwell St Mary because of the investment that we are putting into uh, areas such as. In regards to the second project, the Stanford La Hope Station, a subject quite clearly dear to me, the administration is very clear. The current paralysis of the project for nearly six months since last February has been unnecessary. Residents who live around the station, those who travel from further Stanford La Hope, Corringham, Horndon, Fobbing, do not deserve for this project to be delayed any further. It is high time to get the station project done and that frustrations to achieving that are overcome. The assertion that projects cannot be delivered in phases is flawed. A recent audit of the station phase of the project has verified clearly that even without, with changes to the north side of the wider project around the transport hub in phase two, there will be no material impact on the new station being built. It is ready to go. It was ready to go six months ago. Indeed, those who advocate for not managing projects in phases all look at Perfleet. Imagine a multi-billion pound scheme not being built in phases, but being demanded to develop an entire new town in one go. Let's be frank, developers would laugh at us. And as for the ruling that the authorities should go to tender without planning permission, there are risks that that is high risk, and the planning committee agenda, I believe, has been issued today, uh, which articulates that that is not a position that the authority has taken. Um, for the, for the risk-based reasons behind it. The station design changed a number of months ago, reflecting changes desired by the local community. That pause from reflect was obviously regrettable, but in the long run, beneficial for that reason, and anyone should take solace in that. 
This report seeks to plough a further £10 million into the Stamford La Hope project, getting the station done and helping design a new transport hub on the north side of London Road. Now, these projects are dear to this council, as we are know they are dear to the residents and organisations across the borough who will benefit from them. And we want to enable our officials to see these projects through. By agreeing to this allocation of funding, we accelerate the ability for officers to deliver these projects and get these projects done for the betterment of our borough. Any questions I can happily take. Thank you, Councillor Hale. Any questions? Councillor Coxall. I, I'm, very, I'm very pleased with the uh, capital plan and actually looking at two major projects, we need to make sure that funding isn't them to stop these projects too long. We've, we've worried and, and, uh, and I think this administration through the A13, through the commitments through, for we show, through the, these even, we are committed to these projects, come what may, and then and once the end of it, and these, these numbers are colossal, these numbers are colossal, but to have good projects perfect like what we really want what the residents deserve not half-hearted ones good quality projects delivered instead of half-baked ones that we do, do it by cost we do it we spend the money properly we'll get the good projects and we get some great new assets here for the gen two generations to come exactly um anybody uh, else no i, I mean I'm, I'm solely going to touch on the um projects in phases uh, not last year obviously but the year before um I went up to Alconbury Weald, uh, which is an old uh, American Air Force base, um, where they're building thousands of homes, like four, 6,000 homes, it's huge. Um, and that's, it was very interesting to see their approach, and it was a real, true, phased approach. It was, oh, we'll have some houses here, some houses here, some, this will be this, this will be that. And it was sort of like, okay, and then they just showed the pictures as, as they've moved on. And they weren't anywhere near halfway through. Uh, and we, we saw the old, uh, nuclear survival bunkers and all sorts that were on, on, on the um, estate and I said, yeah, okay, that will be phase seven or phase eight because there was no way they were going to deliver 4,000 homes like that, not even in a one sweep. And if you look as we drove through the estate, or oh, sorry, dr drove through the entire um, project, it was completely different, different builders, different this, different that. Um, and it was all done in phases and the local authority works with it, it worked fine. I cannot see why we can't work in phases for one side of the road and the other side of the road for the station. I, I know I don't do it justice by saying that, but that's pretty much what it boils down to. Um, and equally with the Grey South, as I said, you know, uh, five years ago, was it Council Coxall? We had the Secretary of State and we got the money for the first tranche of money for the underpass. Yeah, five years. Um, and yeah, we're now at a stage, but if we look at what we saw then, what we see now, phase one of that's already been starting to be delivered. We see it at the front of the building. Um, we now start to see a much better um, plaza and everything else that's coming forward. Again, all in phases. So why shouldn't it happen at Stanford? So I fully agree with you on that one. Has anyone else got any statements in relation to this? If not, I'll move to recommendations on page 52. At 1.1 .1 to 1.4, are they agreed? Agreed. Excellent. Moving on to item 14 at page 57. Um, even though it says 59 in the agenda, but page 57, uh, medium term financial strategy um, and budget proposals. Uh, again, Councillor Hebb. Thank you, Leader. Uh, so to the future. We have a choice. We've uh, put forward a plan to tax above referendum limits to pay for additional services that we have, or we reform, change and slim down the size of the council to avoid the burden being borne onto our residents. The administration are clear that taxes should not be the default approach to reforming the finances of this council. This administration believes in the cut in the size of our cloth is critical. That said, there is a reality that needs to be noted. Thurrock is a low-tax council, paying already less than over £170 on council tax in the wider Essex areas. Interestingly, South End Council, who is our nearest statistical neighbour, obviously unitary status on a like-by-like -like service basis, collects around £15 million more per annum than Farrock does for the services that they use and depend. So this means then that the reform and change will obviously therefore be larger. The government's financial support over the last 12 months has been, or 15 months rather, has been very helpful. However, tax receipts are down on previous years as a result of the pandemic as well. And, that, and the outstanding tax rolls into the few forward year uh, as a funding pressure. We continue to stimulate COVID affected services such as social care markets and a number of services still cannot earn uh, what they would do normally owing to social restrictions, although we have everything crossed, that that is soon to be at an end. 
to close this gap, to avoid significant tax rises on Farrakh, difficult decisions will have to follow. And suppose it, it's interesting to ask is why not carry on with investments? The council has earned over 100 million on interest after all dues were paid back and since the joint agreed approach by members to further into the investment market back in 2017. That is almost one year in the last four years of council day-to-day -day spending. That is an extraordinary performance and has allowed Farrakh to pursue the people's priorities above those mandated of a local authority. There are new rules which are coming which will prevent us from continuing that approach. Sadly, news from places like Labour Slough, of which their investments have run a deficit, their reserves depleted years before COVID, and a number of external audit findings being found against them over a few years, or a couple of years rather, galvanises the view, understandably, nationally that rule changes are needed. Furthermore, scare stories from the opposition, proven to be inaccurate, did nothing for confidence in our model, a model which performed, performs, and earned other authorities money to spend on their own desired services to the tune of over 13 million. All of this, sadly, means no more seven to eight digits income to provide the extra services our residents have used and enjoyed over the previous years. Someone asked me last week, why would you stop the approach? I couldn't help but recognise the irony that there are so many that recognise the benefit and of the approach, but we are where we are. So the plan, how, we, how do we become a leaner, outcomes-orientated, focused council? There will be many services which will be reformed, which will mean that how council delivers the services will change and far up becoming smaller, making the right choices about how we operate with a focus very much on core services. Some assets are buildings, that we've just talked about this in great detail. Some are just purely beyond economic repair. And the services need rehousing elsewhere. To finance a repair of bricks and mortar, in some instances, is going to be unfoldable. But a home is more than bricks and mortar. It is what goes on within it. And that is why, in the spirit of what Councillor Hewling was saying earlier, in terms of the Thames side and the arts and cultural offer that we want in Farrakh, that is what we have to remember and strive for. But we can do that in different, and in many instances, better surroundings, something that Councillor Coxshaw talked about a little while ago in terms of disposal of uh, uneconomic assets to reinvest into providing new services. And some assets, capital projects and services, are those that simply have always fallen outside the remit of what a local authority can do, certainly in the post-COVID, post-investment world. And this in turn means that vacancies and roles considered non-critical or aligned to non-concluding capital projects or projects that won't be taken forward now will not be replaced or maintained when current projects conclude. And those that are working on projects or in other chargeable services are charged correctly or appropriately to the relevant project. And there will be some staff who find their service reformed or capital projects no longer taken forward, which may mean that their role is no longer required. And as we progress with plans, we will do all we can to protect our permanent workforce and support all those who may be affected. The protection of the front line services, as always, will be our priority, and if, but efficiencies will be expected across the wider organisation as well. There are a number of proposals that are to be put forward to overview and scrutiny for their valued thought and input, which we commit to reflecting on, on their feedback in a meaningful manner. It has to be said that there are proposals that I don't think anyone would want to have to consider, but the administration is committed to making sure that there is openness in some of the ideas that have been presented and that there is an authenticity that we are open to ideas and discussion that comes forward, much like what Councillor Cottrell was saying earlier about the assets programme. It's very similar in that regard. Indeed, officers are looking hard into house building and other income generating ideas, which will, could help reduce the pressure whilst enabling social good at the same time. So in conclusion, the administration take the duty that residents have trusted us with seriously and dutifully. <coughs> Even after the last 12 months, the electorate of this borough gave a great ring of confidence to the Farrakh Conservative Party by electing 29 councillors, I think, for the first time in our borough's history. We take that responsibility incredibly seriously. And we will do that by trying to keep taxes as low as possible, but we will need to take some tough decisions so we can avoid the vulnerable going without the care they deserve 
and to build back after this pandemic in a way that is sustainable for the future. Everything I've just talked about takes a 34.3 million gap leader down to a 3.7 million theoretical gap, but there is obviously more work to be done. The administration ready to, stands ready to lead this borough through this challenge. Residents expect politics to be put aside, and we hope to work constructively with everybody and groups in the reforms that lie ahead. Happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Councillor Hebb. Uh, Councillor Spielman. I must say, it, it has always frustrated me how you can make um, a hundred million pounds for this borough, which has been spent on lots of extra services that we wouldn't have been able to pay for otherwise, and continue to be making huge profits, um, have a what has proved to be an almost COVID-proof investment portfolio, which is something that very few businesses have proved to be during this pandemic. And yet the sort of narrative out there would be that this strategy has been unsuccessful. I um, was pretty disappointed with some of the comments and some of the behaviours from the opposition um, some of the influences to really valued members of this council who've done an exceptional job um, and unfortunately due to really irresponsible decisions from other councils we're having to stop making a hundred million quid every few years I mean and that's what it boils down to you know and it, it is been disappointing again like the theatre how this has been reported <coughs> I, I can do nothing but praise um, Sean Clark um, he's done a fantastic job and if it wasn't for Covid we'd be ploughing on and falling straight into the Freeport bringing in an another few hundred million to this council I mean the, the, in terms of the the investment strategy and securing that free pool. It's been an absolutely fantastic job by all those involved. And I just wish that we could get across uh, effectively the benefits that this investment strategy has brought. I support it from the off. Um, I thought that, you know, that the future of councils were to be social enterprises um, and to generate money to spend um, to uh, on you know uh, and be innovative like this, and and we did a great job. And it's only a, like, as I say, it's only a pandemic which has stopped us continuing to make all this money. Um, so yeah, it's been a source of frustration for me. Well, pandemic and two broke uh, Labour-run local authorities. Uh, Councillor Hev, as ever, you speak far more concisely than me, Leader. <laughs> I mean, just, just echoing the point that, that, that Councillor Spill made, certainly about the officers who have strived to work with the administration to deliver something which not only delivered additional services but also contributed to social good. I mean, when that feedback come back earlier about the green good, if I can call it that, I, literally my jaw dropped. I know that sounds very theatrical, but the fact of the matter is that one part of our portfolio, which ironically happens to be the one that's been criticised publicly, um, more than anything, has literally generated the same amount of energy as Farrakh twice over for a year. I, I don't know where else I can say that more impactfully, to be honest with you. It's pretty significant. And I, I think going back to Councillor Spielman's point, I mean, certainly towards the turn of the decade, there was a, certainly an encouragement for local authorities to become more self-sufficient and entrepreneurial. I think they were the exact expressions. And we embraced that, but we did that. And, and Cabinet and Director's Board and the officers... We didn't just run away and do something. We put, uh, there'd be loads of us that were here. There were the conversations we had about what we should, what we should not do. We looked at high streets. We vetoed that because of the risks that we anticipated. But none of us prophesized COVID. I'm not going to make that claim. That would just be ludicrous. That said, we did be very pointed in what we went after. And the benefits have been literally quite stark. But, alas, um, as you summarised about three minutes ago, we are where we are. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Councillor Foxhall. 
Yeah, there's two points I'd like to make. It's, um, when we first took administration in 2016, there were some issues about what we should invest in, and, and the Chief Executive and, and Sean Clark we were, we were very, how do we invest? How do we take Eric Pickles, his, uh, his, when he was a local government, come up with this idea? We, we could our own, see our own destiny, and we make our own destiny. We took it with open arms, and, and, uh, and, and it's a shame that it's coming to an end now, but I think it's coming to an end, it just needs, it, we're coming to an end with Freeport, we discussed at the end last tonight, well, we will see that over, but it's just this point, at this point, to change this. And I think it's, it's always comes an advantage, we can look at other ideas now, and I think the, with the documents you've just raised tonight, and the reports raised tonight, bring them advantages to us now, and we may, be, we may not have looked at them if we didn't have that opportunity, so there's always an opportunity. But I must say, the, the, on my political point, which I haven't made many tonight, that the, 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 the leader of the opposition goes on Extinction Rebellion, moans about carbon neutral, puts a thing last year to actually make us climate neutral 20 years before the government does, and then wants to keep old adapted buildings, wants to stop what has made a huge investment into carbon neutral with our investment strategy, not only in buildings, investing, making sure we end up with a green energy and a green government, doing our bit for the environment, and that's not acceptable. We, I, I just don't, what, what, how can we get to climate neutral? And is there a problem there between the opposition one saying one thing and doing another? Uh, Councillor, if you want to respond, if you don't want to respond, I can respond on that latter part, being a member of the uh, Climate Change Committee. Wait for it. <laughs> it, is, it is truly incredulous, actually, to be honest with you. I mean, we've, we've got an opposition that didn't want to raise council tax, doesn't want the investment approach. Despite the fact in February 2019 they voted for £2 billion worth of borrowing and took credit for the approach, and if you remember, tried to steal that fr from yourself. Um, and, then, and then put, I, I, I think I'm going to, how do I put this specifically? Put untruths on literature around our borough, saying that things have failed when they, well, 100 million reasons why they haven't. Um, and then they begin to crow about things that need to change. Well, if you remember, folks, we told them, be careful what you wish for. All the scaremongering, all the noises that come, the lack of confidence in ourselves as a borough, which previously stood united under Councillor Gerrish, if you remember, um, <laughs> simply mean that be careful what you wish for, because guess what, here we are. Uh, we're now at a point where we can't do it. So, you know, I, uh, I hope some people are proud of themselves. That said, <coughs> I do want to just reinforce the point. The Cabinet were always of the view, Leader, that the approach wouldn't be forever. Because we did need to reform the size of the council. Um, there was no doubt of that. Core spending uh, did need to be reformed. And we did make some great progress. You know, look at children's centres, for example. Um, a great reform which took services from an outreach of, I think, of about 65 to 70% up to the dizzier heights of 85 90%. All because of a fewer buildings, better services ethic. That just goes to show that when you think of quality, not necessarily just thinking of the bricks and mortar of our long memories, if we think of what we actually want to achieve, rather than perhaps what we once had, what we can do. But, yeah, it's, uh, I think Councillor Cox will summarise it perfectly. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Hebb. I, I mean, you know, a, a simple thing. At the end of the high street, we have a bin that will alert us when it's full. It doesn't have to be cleaned out every day. It doesn't have to be cleaned out every two days, three days. It will tell us when we're full. It's about embracing that change as we go forward and making it more smart uh, to deliver. A, either better or, or at least the same services. Um, before we move to the vote, just a, a few things. Obviously, when you said um, about you know, approving a £2 billion investment uh, strategy that then tried to steal from me, I take it more to steal from us. You know, we, we all did this. We all spent those, those, those hard nights together in, in my office and various other offices deciding what should we do, should we do this, should we not do this? You know, and uh, we get back to uh, where do we put our investment in solar energy? Um, not just because it's green, because quite frankly, if it fails, it means the sun's not shining. And we've got a little bit more to worry about if the sun stops shining. Um, so, you know, definitely the right thing. And I think the other thing that needs to be taken away from this is not the doom and gloom, not the one in four um, staff will lose their job or anything else like that. It's about allocating it to other budgets, to capital budgets for capital works. It's about reshaping uh, what we're doing. As I say, you know, won't use the bin specifically, but there's many other things that we can do to transform the service. But it's also about shaping the way that Thurrock works as a borough for the future. We've got Thames, we've got the Freeport coming. 
Um, so we know in a couple of years time, three years time, that the money will start to flow in the form of uh, tax receipts uh, to us for infrastructure, for improvements to make sure the Freeport works efficiently, to make sure, you know, it, literally the live, work and play mantra of, of Council Coxshaw is truly delivered. So we need to make sure that we're ready for the future. So it's not just about saying, okay, you, 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 I'm sorry, we don't need you anymore. It's also sat about saying, actually, we've got all these people that we've not employed for a period of time. You know, we're not going to employ them, although they still sit on our books as a, a potential spend. And actually, we're going to have different people because we're going to need different people as we go forward, whether it be air quality officers, uh, whether it be whomever. Um, so it's not just about saying all these people must go. It's also about saying, actually, the, the service itself as a whole needs to change to be able to deliver and deliver this free port, not just for Thurrock, not just for the businesses in Thurrock and the residents of Thurrock, but literally the whole of the southeast of the country. Um, so make, you, make sure UK PLC is not just open for business, um, we're making sure that it's doing business. Um, so, um, oh, and the final thing is, of course, it's not just £100 million for us, it's £13 million for other local authorities, as you said, and indeed public service pension funds. So where that lack of confidence uh, has happened in the past because of, you know, I'm not going to revisit the past, but because of the past, to all those leaders and all those Section 151 officers and everybody else out there, £100 million in three years, a 10% return on their investment with not one missed repayment ever. Where are you going to get that without the risk? Literally, you're going to get that money without the risk. So think about it. Ignore what the, the background noise and start thinking of the residents there. Start putting your investments back, you know, across the board, across the local authority partnership, not just with Thurrock, um, and start to get that, that money in uh, to supply those services that all residents will need, whether your local authority has gone bust, as we've seen in uh, Slough and Croydon recently, uh, or even as far back as Hackney in the 2000s. Um, but just to make sure that you can get that risk-free money back in by you know working with ourselves uh, and improving it not just for Thurrock but for the whole of uh, the uh, portfolio that uh, loaned to us so with that I'm going to move to page 57 1.1 to 1.3 are we all agreed excellent moving on to item 15 which is page 69 not 71 as it is on the agenda list um, housing delivery approach it's joint report Councillor Coxall and Councillor Spielman Councillor Coxall first Oh, I'm going to tell you what, you've heard oh, enough no, for me. For I'm going to let Councillor Spillman have this one because he's been sitting there anticipating it. Thank you very much. Um, th this report is just about getting our... You know, I'll be very brief with this because this report is about getting our ducks in a row, really, um, to start what will hopefully be a new... You know, turn a new page regarding housing delivery um, and to start doing some things that are not just, you know amazing for Thurrock but um, amazing when compared to all of our neighbours and other councils our size around around the country now as we know housing development has been very difficult there's been financial restraints on the HRA and um, we've had Covid which has just you know blown a hole in you know a lot of these ambitions but uh, I've been tasked with get, getting this this going with with Mark and I'm really pleased to be working with Mark on this and I've had some very very positive initial discussions with officers they understand the ambition that I've got they understand the need that there is in Thurrock and and we're giving them um, the scope to bring forward some very very ambitious and very very impressive projects now that will be for a various delivery methods that will be through hopefully joint ventures with uh, private sector um, we'll be looking at what we can do with uh, Thorough Regeneration Limited um, and we'll be concentrating on providing not just council homes but homes that local people can afford to buy and get on the property ladder um, there are too many people who are in their late 20s, early 30s, who are still living with mum and dad um, and who desperately want their own home. And I think that the sun is now shining again on, on the HRA. 
after some very difficult years. I think we've got a very supportive government. I think we've got a superb Secretary of State with some huge ambition, uh, especially in terms of homelessness, um, which is very encouraging. And I think we can do some things that are very special and bring forward some very special projects for council to consider. Specifically regarding homelessness, again, I must pay tribute to not just the outgoing de directors, but my predecessor, Barry Johnson. Uh, you know, the, the crisis that a lot of councils are facing because of COVID, that financial crisis was a crisis that the HRA, you know, in terms of financial crisis, was facing several years ago. And Barry and Rob before him had the hardest period to be a portfolio holder in 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 a housing um, in the housing portfolio for a very long time, and, and they've managed to negotiate this. And I've been given a wonderful opportunity. I've been given a housing department in ruder health than it has been for many many years. And so, yeah, I hope that I can uh, work with Mark, work with Sean, work with Ian, and do some pretty special things. Um, and this is just the start of that. I, I've, I've tasked officers to bring me some pretty ambitious plans. And I've just said, you know, bring me the biggest, you know, the most impressive things that you can do. And then we'll work back from that point to an acceptable level of risk. Um, we've got better finances, we've got a majority. Um, and I personally, I think that, you know, if we can't deliver it now, then when are we going to deliver it? So from my point of view, it's just time to crack on. I think Councillor Bill, uh, Councillor Boxer. Yeah, I just wanted to echo that, but th this is another thing building on this, this tonight is they've got a theme. And then there is, there is a theme about when the council should be involved and when the council shouldn't and when it should be removing its assets and then in reinvesting in the public realm. There is an intuition, and I'm a conservative, and I believe in in, in, the, in the capitalist way of working, and I believe in the, the, this government, this council, should stay out as long as possible. But there is a broken thing, and the Secretary of State said it in his housing white paper, and this council is full administration is fully behind what they found. It's a broken housing market in Thurrock. We've got a broken housing market, like. I may have had it difficult when we grew up that house prices were going upwards, rents were going upwards. It's ten times worse now. Like you can't, it's ten times your income to get the average house. It is not acceptable, and, and our conservative administration, uh, this administration, should do something about it. And that's when we should intervene in the housing market. And like the Secretary of State has asked us to, I'm keen for planning reform. This administration wants to see them planning reforms come forward. We want to see, we were pleased with the HRA, we lobbied for the HRA release, and that's what we can do now. And we're in a, COVID has delayed us by a year, and I'm nearly pleased that we've got to do that. You see that in the executive summary, we couldn't get them housing numbers. That thousand houses, I want to see moved higher and faster. And that's what we've got to do. It's got to be higher and faster and more off to deliver these, and we've got to intervene in the housing market here. I want to see low cost housing that people can buy or rent at a reasonable place to make sure they do work, live and play here. And this is the part of the liver's render of here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Coxall. Uh, before I put it out to other members, um, it's the LJ conference today, uh, as you can probably see by the slightly glazed look on my face. Um, it's not as much fun as it normally is, as I'm sure the Chief Exec will um, attest. Uh, it being virtual, it's, there's not much scope. It's what, you know, literally what you get is what you're going to get. There's no plenary sessions outside or fringe sessions or anything. Um, but a term or terms that came up today that I noticed that was being used more often is not just affordable housing, affordable rents and social rent are making the very clear distinction that social rent is not affordable rent. Social rent is there for those that really, truly cannot afford pretty much anything. Then there's the affordable rent, which is the amount that you can afford to rent based on your salary. That also goes to the affordable housing, obviously to uh, a fair degree. This is not what you think you can afford, but what is, can, can be afforded by a formula. Um, so it's really good to hear what we've heard tonight, which is angling towards that. Um, to, you know, as Councillor Coxwell says, you know, sort of five times, sorry, ten times joint salary. Um, you know, I, I've seen many, many houses recently up for sale for 450, 500,000. Uh, lovely homes, lovely homes. Nothing that you'd think, you know, half a million pound for living on a main road and everything else, but that's what it's worth. Um, that's what Thurrock is becoming. So we need to increase the uh, numbers of houses that 
people can afford, the number of houses in total, start to level off that market, make it unbroken and start to deliver. Obviously, it's not just us, it's every local authority trying to do this. You know, builders can go into London and earn an extra X pound an hour and they're going to sort of try there. So we need to make sure that we can attract on joint ventures and the TRL and our own home building, whatever we need to do to start to deliver this. And I like the fact that we are not looking at, well, we can do this, but if we push it, we could do something slightly bigger. We're saying, okay, this is the big thing, slide it down to the risk is acceptable. Um, and then start delivering that, which is really good to hear. And of course, not just your tr traditional wet build, I'm sure Mark will get upset now, but not just your traditional wet build, but also your modular homes um, and, and the non-traditional builds um, to, to start delivering them. Uh, I've seen plenty uh, in my time. I've been up to the building research um, uh, establishment uh, up in Hertfordshire. It's, you know, what's out there on the market, and that was two years ago. It was fantastic. It must be even better by now. Apologies, I'd need to rent that one out. Anyone else got anything to say? Um, Councillor Duffin, sorry, I was just trying to not joke. Just, uh, with regards to point zero point one, suffered a devastating pandemic, and uh, also then with other things going on, a uh, free kick has been uh, converted. So uh, we're under good management though with Councillor Spillman and hopefully there's enough time to turn it around. Is that some kind of coded message? <laughs> Thank you, Councillor. I couldn't possibly comment, but Mikkel Damsberg has uh, ruined it. Ah, that's no wonder Councillor, um, uh, um, Councillor Spillman left the room. Um, uh, even though it is Councillor Duffin's uh, report, I uh, will still move the recommendations on page 70 at 1.1. Uh, Cabinet support of the approach of housing delivery is set out in this report. Is that agreed? agreed. Excellent. We'll move on now to uh, item 16, which is the Towns Fund update and next step. Councillor Cockshaw. No, she could be checking on my chin out. Um, I, was, yeah, I was hoping to give some good news tonight, but um, we're still waiting for the government to come back to us with the business case, uh, go ahead to form business cases. But obviously, this is a good time um, to have a uh, to look at the what the Tilbury and Grace investment boards have been doing. And now, can you see there some great images of what their plans? And it's very ambitious and amazing. Um, just to, I'm sure you all know, but for the sake of the everyone else, the, the boards, the Prime Minister. Um, insisted after post Brexit to make sure that these these towns, the, the 100 in most in need towns in the country, needed investment, and they got offered up to 25 million pounds to produce a a investment strategy. And then we go through. Uh, we've been hearing regularly over the few months. I've been in Essex, I believe Harlow and Colchester have heard already. They put theirs in early. We're still waiting. I'm hoping very shortly to get that news that we can move forward. But that. We've got two. We're blessed. We're not blessed, really. We have two two town grounds, which is quite hard. And obviously, it shows what the need and the, uh, the government's commitment to the area. If you look at Greys, oh, I've just mentioned just a few fantastic things that Greys are proposing. They're proposing a new jetty to bring back the jetty into Greys. Um, it's interesting that Greys station is the nearest station to the London Resort if it goes ahead. It's a great opportunity for our residents to be in Greys and use a jetty. The River Activity Centre, which is really in my heart of hearts, I really would like to see that, to bring use and children using the, using the Thames, just like we see that in, in South End, we see the fantastic use of the Thames, we learning to use how the Thames, learning to rescue canoe, play in, the, play in the river safely. And I'd really like to see this used as well, to a new home for the Thurrock Sea Cadets. For too long, they've been without a home for many years now, and that'd be really good to see. Uh, the new promenade, so we can actually walk along, you, as you walk along the, 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 beat, the wall, you can look over the wall and actually level with the wall. We can actually do something there and, and level it up so there's a great way of walking up and down the, the actual beach area and looking at this, uh, the actual fantastic river that we, so we see. And then a huge investment into the Grace Peach Park, in tuning a permanent outdoor entertainment space and what we can do, a refreshed, renewed restaurant now. And we've been spent some money already, there's half a million been already spent on there, but we can spend millions, millions more. So that's what we hope to. 
In Tilbury, they're proposing an £8 million new youth centre, and I took calls today after uh, Councillor Mays put up there, and I had, a couple, I had a call from a lady saying, where is this? What's happening? I've never heard of it. How can I find out more? And um, so I think the excitement in Tilbury is coming to that, and, and an £8 million investment into a brand new state-of-the-art uh, youth centre there, instead of what we've seen in the asset disposal, a small youth centre, we can actually have, have amazing community building. A new community building, a community building in Tilbury that's open to the community, not to be a members club, not to be banding people and choosing people, not blackballing people, a community centre that works in Tilbury, that is for the community, it's used by the community, and there's no real re rules and regulations of actually hiring and buying it. Um, that's been too long missing in Tilbury and needs to happen. Uh, I know I, we also, it's also the new beach and a new jetty and more play equipment. Large open spaces in Tilbury and over and over again, they've got these spaces, What there's nothing in them. There's nothing in, in them and, we, and the council leader and us and ourselves were at an event, very wet and rent, but um, we, that's the start of the investment. That's the first few hundred thousand pound investment, but to see cricket pitches, cricket squares, football pitches there properly on that thing, laid out, looked after. That's what we want to see down there. And um, with that would be an amazing list of, of, of prices. All this has to be delivered, otherwise the government will want it back by 2025. This is no like pipe dreams, no, it'll come, it'll come, we'll see it. In 97, it never happens. This has got to happen, otherwise we give the money back. So. That's a really hard commitment, and it's a hard task for the office to deliver this amount of projects, amount of work, and, um, and it's going to be an ambitious next four years. Thank you, Councillor Coltshaw. Um, Mike? Um, Councillor Stafford. Thank you very much. Um, I think often we sometimes see the opposition concede own goals, and that can lead to levelling of the playing field, and certainly this investment into Greys is fantastic for us as a uh, community, and it's something that is incredibly welcome. And uh, no, long may it continue, um, and uh, it's an exciting moving forward. Yeah, nothing better when it's levelled. Um, uh, uh, Councillor Mays. Thank you, Leader. The, the investment in Tilbury is, is going to be fantastic. I mean, I, when I got elected in 2019, time and time again, we, we heard that there's not enough for people in Tilbury, there's not enough for young people, there needs to be more, more investment in the town. And that's just exactly what this town's fund is doing for Tilbury and Greys, but um, especially Tilbury, the, the, the youth centre, which I, I did put up on social media last night, I know some people get worried about it, some people are really excited about it, but I just think the general buzz is fantastic because once this gets delivered, and as, as uh, Councillor Cottrell said, it will be delivered, and it has to be delivered, doesn't it, by a certain time, it's just going to transform the lives of young people within, within this area. And it's just, it's just astronomical. So thank you for the government for, for doing this. Cockshaw? Well, it, it is all part of our levelling up agenda. <laughs> and so we must always think about that. And, 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 and it's really good that the government's doing this. But it is an onerous task, I mentioned again, on the regeneration team. This is a not an under, it's unsubstantiable, but it's going to be difficult, and that we and that we've got to make sure that regeneration. The cabinet colleagues support the regeneration team as we go, because this is not just the standard capital projects which we discussed earlier. This is a, it could be a fifty million pounds injection, and very quickly, um, which we've got to move quickly. And and the, the the thing, but I must say, it may well be everyone is catching on to the the new youth centre, but it's their community centre. I think working with uh, you, you in the in down there in the small little shop down there on one community that they're not, not having community spaces not having a space they can book quite easily for a birthday not having a space that they can book for a party or a wedding in Tilbury has meant the community's <laughs> lost its heart and um, and I do hope the people who do run the community buildings in Tilbury re-look at what they're really there for and uh, but we instead we're building a new building because they don't want to if it's not open a community building for the public this council will take control and put one there for people of the public and the people of Tilbury. I just say, we're going to give Tilbury love. It's been missing for too long. I was waiting for that at some point. I mean, obviously, I'm one of the very few... Actually, I think there is only... Uh, yeah, Councillor Maney in the chamber uh, that would have remembered um, in the 2000s and 
eight tens, no, even before that, sorry, in the 2000s when there was a um, so-called investment in Tilbury. Um, the port did a great deal of work, you know, sort of trying to uh, help improve the area. There was money being spent. Uh, and, and to this day, people say, where's that 20 million gone? Um, and, you know, we are talking about, obviously, you know, two decades ago. Um, but this really is delivery, and not just for Tilbury, obviously uh, for Greys as well. Um, if, you know, it's worth a look through the uh, agenda pack at some of the fantastic, fantastic projects that have not only been delivered, but as we go through, will be delivered. Um, you know, beaches, who would have thought proper beaches in, in, in Thurrock, in two areas, not just one, two areas. Um, you know, this is really just ab absolutely fantastic. Um, I'm going to touch on what Councillor Coxwell said about the River um, Activity Centre. Um, everybody knows I've travelled to Germany quite a bit. Um, you know, you, you go to any major town, you go past any major river or even the minor rivers, there's always activity centres. Um, not necessarily big, organised, you know, um, like yacht club type things. Uh, sometimes they just, um, you know, uh, they'll set a bay aside uh, within the river so you've got a natural flow but not too much flow and you'll see the children in there you'll see people swimming up and down in there uh, it's absolutely fantastic and it, you know we look at south end with their lagoon um you know, one of the really good attractions there there's no reason why stuff like this can't happen in thurrock and indeed this this 50 million pounds in, in total you know hopefully that we'll get is going to be able to deliver that which is going to be absolutely brilliant as we go forward there are a couple of recommendations uh Recommendation 1.1 to 1.4 and page 86. Are they all agreed? Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now move on to uh, approval of naming and numbering of streets and highways assets, um, which can be found at, <laughs> I think it's 163. Um, Councillor Mayne, I understand you've got quite a large report to deliver here. I have. Um, and whilst we're on numbers, it pleases me to report that it's one all in a, a certain contest that's taking place. But I think it's probably fair to say, Leader, that the, in the context of this agenda and the items on it, the sceptics might think this is a, the most important item, but I beg to differ, so I will elaborate. Um, the Council does have a statutory, statutory duty to oversee street naming and numbering in the borough, and I think if anyone thinks, you know, well, so what, take a trip around the Flowers Estate in Ockenden. You'll see an example. Try and navigate it on election day and follow the numbering sequence, and uh, it's like a countdown conundrum, one that I've failed many times over 20 years. But, as I say... We do have a statutory duty, but we don't have a framework, we don't have a policy underpinning that. And it would just help officers, it would help developers if we did. We had something that we could refer to. Um, and uh, this is what this really does. It brings together good practice, it reminds us of our legal obligations, and um, it also um, it, it encompasses what the council has traditionally done anyway. There's not really much in it that's new, and there's nothing in it you wouldn't expect to see, apart from a slight deviation from our normal practice uh, and that's in relation to street or asset naming when it comes to people dead or otherwise um, apparently the council has had a long-standing position whereby we don't name roads or assets or buildings after people i don't know when that came about because the people who named king edward drive in my ward obviously weren't told about that or any of the other assets that are named after people but somewhere along the lines it's been decided we don't name assets or roads after people um, we do get requests for that in the time that I've been a portfolio holder. We've had a request from a community forum to name a road after a fallen serviceman, which was refused because of the, the I wouldn't call it the policy, we didn't have one, the practice that we'd adopted. That's something I think we should change, and that's, that's why I've, I've asked for the, this, when the draft policy was put to me, I asked for it to be amended so that there was a mechanism in place where we can, or members of the public can, propose that we name roads or assets after uh, people who have made a contribution to the borough or even a contribution to the country. So um, that's provided for in the policy. I think it's a way of injecting a, a small amount of civic pride into the borough going forward. We're going to have a lot more development coming our way. There's every reason we should commemorate people who have made a contribution to our borough by naming things after them. So. As I say, most of what's in the report you'd expect to see. The only addition, the only change is in relation to naming assets and streets and whatnot after people. 
and I will just commend the policy to Cabinet. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Maney. I'm sure, obviously, the residents of uh, Frederick Andrews Court or Alf Lowen Court would also wonder at what point did we bring that in um, after the names of uh, former councillors um, uh, of the borough, amongst others. Uh, indeed, I believe there's um, uh, one in Tilbury, which was no more than perhaps 20 years old. But again, it's got the uh, carries the name of the former councillor. Um, any questions or comments in relation to this report? No. It is right that we start to reverse that and start naming streets after those that have um, contributed to the borough or contributed to the nation. Um, and you know, whilst there might, might be some uneasy, uneasiness as what will happen in the future, uh, or what might um, happen as that, you know, um, as we go forward, we have to um, accept the fact that probably 95% of the time, if not 99% of the time, when streets are named after uh, local people who have um, uh, made a contribution, that there's no problem with that, um, and it really celebrates their bit, that, that that person's life um, and their contribution uh, going forward. So someone can say, um, as we found it out in Gunning um, Road on uh, Little Thurrock, um, the uh, airman that lost his life during the Second World War, uh, where he crashed his uh, plane into the cliff, um, and we, the, the street was named after him. And now, you know, everybody lives in Gunning Road knows, um, which is you know, absolutely fantastic. And there's no reason why we shouldn't be doing that and not have to wait 50 years, 60 years, 70 years for it happening. So with that, move on to 1.1 1 .1 at page 163. Are we all agreed? Excellent. We move on to... Um, Council made a second report, which is the Highway Street Lighting Central Management System, 185, I believe it will be. Yep. Uh, Councillor Maney. Thank you. I'll refer to it as a CMS. Um, I'm actually quite pleased to be presenting this report because I think in terms of the difference it will make um, to the highways team um, when it comes to the maintenance and the uh, general good running of our street lighting infrastructure, it's, it's a major step forward. We've got 21,000 street lights. We all take them for granted unless they're not working and then the complaints come thick and fast. And that happened earlier this year when we had a much higher than usual failure, column failure rate. We had to take out street lights, sometimes whole rows of street lights in, in certain rows and the complaints came thick and fast. So this, the Cabinet agreed to the recommendation, will really make the the monitoring and the maintenance of our network much easier. We've got 21,000 columns, as the report says. They all have to be manually inspected. We rely on members of the public to tell us when they're not working. We have to have drive-bys to make sure that they are working. And it, it's time-consuming and it's resource-intensive. Via this system, we'll be able to monitor our entire infrastructure remotely. We'll know when they're not working. We'll know when they are working. And there's a significant financial saving, which is in the report. But there's also an environmental benefit. If you look at the reduction in um, our carbon footprint that this is going to realise, on, on the financial front and what it does for, in terms of meeting our obligation um, in becoming a greener council, it's a major step in the right direction. I don't think we can downplay that. As I said, it does allow us to control street lighting levels remotely, and naturally that's invited some people to say, are we going to do part night lighting, as in other parts of Essex? The answer to that is categorically no. The lights will be staying on in Thurrock. Um, there is a conversation to be had around, do we look to realise further savings by dimming the lights at, in certain places or across the borough? I've, that's a separate conversation, but it's been put to me that we can make further savings by dimming the light, but by such a minimal amount that it's not detectable to the human eye. We'll leave that to the boffins, but the point is there is, you know, further scope perhaps for financial savings, but absolutely not. We're not going to be turning the lights off. They're staying on. We don't approve of part night lighting. It won't be happening in Thurrock. Um, I don't think there's much more for me to say. Um, I'm happy to take any questions, but other than that, I would just commend the, the report and the recommendation to Cabinet. Uh, thank you, Councillor Maney. Councillor Hebb? Thanks, uh, uh, Leader. Thanks, Councillor Maney, for the report. I, I, this is pure and simple preventative maintenance. Um, it's what industry does very well. Uh, it predicts failure, or is able to identify failure that's coming down the road and able to proactively intervene, do the corrective action before it becomes a problem. So before an area is suddenly completely out of lights altogether, we can deal with it well in advance. You know, we're, we're not back in the 1900s where we've got chaps going around on 
bikes, you know, torching up and checking whether the candles are all there and all that sort of stuff. This is purely innovative. Is what industry does very well. Um, I think it's to be applauded. Oh, thank you, Councillor Hev. Anybody else? I mean, again, this touches on what we said earlier about working smarter, um, not just like, working harder or, or doing less. Um, uh, we, we've all had it. We've all done it. Um, you know, Mrs. Smith at number 23 has said the light outside number 57 isn't working. Uh, someone goes along and says, no, it's actually perfectly fine. And actually, it's outside 157. I don't expect our officers to be driving up and down trying to find the one street light that's out and then turns up and finds out the reason it's out is because there's uh, a net UK power network problem. It's nothing to do with the actual light bulb itself. So, yeah, um, just simple things. Um, and if this process will really, well, introducing the system will really, really help. Um, and of course, we get back as pretty much another theme, probably an undetected theme this evening, is you know, a, a reduction in our carbon footprint. Uh, who'd have thought by introducing something remote that we're going to end up saving all this um, carbon tonnage, um, all of this road travel? You know, those uh, officers that are out on the road at night trying to look up and down every single road, trying to find every single road that's not well lit, etc., they're not going to have to do that anymore, um, which means they can get on with other duties and those vehicles are not going to be blocking the roads. So I'm going to move at 185, the cabinet, sorry, the recommendation at 1.1, cabinet approved the commencement of the tender process subsequent award to the contract to install central management system for highway street lighting. Are we all agreed? Excellent. Move, moving on to um, another very intense report, um, the procurement of energy for Thurrock Council, pages 189 and for some reason, it's with Councillor Cockshaw. I know certainly when I had the portfolio, whole, uh, portfolio for central services, I used to love this report every couple of years. Um, so uh, perhaps in future it will go back to central services. Councillor Cockshaw. No, I think it's not a power grab here. I, I really enjoyed reading this report. <laughs> and I've got a long bit of paper to discuss it tonight. And so we'll see if we can get to full time. No, it's obviously we're not. I'm not going to take your time on this one. Um, it's just uh, uh, furthering the four years, and um, I just seek everyone's opinion so we can move on to this and get excited and talk about the free pool. Thank you, Lisa. This report is about supporting the continuation of the Better Care Fund, which going forward I think is the right thing to do. It's a joint agreement between the Council, the NHS and the Clinical Commissioning Group that pools our resources and strengthens our working relationships to drive integration of the National Health Service and adult social care services that we provide. It focuses on the health and well-being of those in the borough of 65 and over and the preventative care measures to reduce further intervention via hospitalisation or admission to residential care homes. So by agreeing the recommendations, we allow the Director of Adult Social Services to continue to procure this joined up approach to, to providing care. And uh, we envisage contributions to funding to be similar to last year, although that's still got to be agreed. Uh, with the Council continuing hosting the funding, thus giving us joint control of existing NHS spend in the borough. This report is asking in principle to go ahead with the current approach and once negotiations with the NHS and CCG are completed and the agreement drawn up, the Director of Adult Social Services will bring back a paper to Cabinet uh, with the costings and the Section 75 agreement structure so that we can approve it or make some recommendations about change if we need to. Okay, and I'll just to take notice of the time, it is uh, coming up to 2100. Um, uh, it is, it obviously, it's very important um, that, that we get this right. Better care funding does help people stay at home longer. Um, and, you know, it's that whole, not just adding life 
sorry, years to life, as in life to years. Um, and yeah, it really, it really is quite um, something that we have got right, we are doing right, and this will continue this, so I'm quite happy. So move the recommendations on page 214, at recommendations 1.1 to 1.3. Are they agreed? Excellent, thank you. Um, moving on to uh, pages 291, uh, which is the Thames Freeport outline business case and full business case to government, um, and that's uh, item 21, Councillor Cockshaw. Yes, this is a, this report mainly seeks to delegate the powers so we can move uh, speedily over before September that we can actually move to actually sign off on the business case during the summer and giving the delegation to myself, the leader and the chief executive to move speedily to a conclusion to get the business case in by the in. in. This really does mean then that we can get this get the, be the first free port open in the country by the end of the year if the government approves us in the end. Uh, what that means really to let's talk about it about what we've been doing tonight that means between 200 and 300 million pounds um in to the government by tw into this council by 2030. that is transformational again of like we've been doing with investment strategy that is a huge amount of money for all of us living in here to see them in, in see them great in, uh, like new roads in Stamford to actually relieve the heat, a new leisure centre in the high sh in, in, in uh, the new parks opening uh, uh, across the river. These are transformational infrastructure that we're going to see come from this pre port. I know we see more trucks and move movements, but we've got to solve that. We're solving that by our carbon agenda about what the port's looking at, and the free port is delivering uh, massive plans to deliver hydrogen. And we can change from changing from our petrol storage, which we've had over a hundred years for a pet from mobile to shell, and we've embraced changes through that. We're, we're most our generations of people have worked on the river are there, and we can see that again with this new freeport. Generations of our families are going to be living in Thurrock, benefiting from that, and they're going to these this freeport with the, in conjunction with the hard work the chief executive's done on this to make sure that we get the best outcome, and we're at the table of the Freeport Board, but we just need to move forward now. But just to put in mind, that could be £300 million in our coffers, extra, not on the list, not there, that we can decide what we spend on. 49 councils have got a momentous decisions to make over the next four or five years of what we do with this. Um, and we're all one, you know, this authority is, a, is, is like a, an oasis, an opportunity. Don't drop it. And I welcome quite the opposition to think the same as well. All 49 of us have got a momentous decisions to make. Uh, we have indeed. Um, before I pass over to uh, Councillor Hebb, Councillor Hebb, could I just ask you to take over the meeting for a short time? I just need to take a very urgent call. Thank you. Certainly, I, I shan't move, but <laughs> certainly. I've lost my trail of thought now. I was, and I can't <laughs> remember what I was going to speak then. From a... From a Freeport perspective, I, I, I think no, I know what I was going to say. Thurrock has had some very seismic moments in its time where something quite large has come to it and provided you know, some significant good. I mean, you can go back, what, 30 years ago when Lakeside come along. You know, that was transformational. You know, the old quarry pits that become the, the employment hub, the cultural hub, the entertainment hub, the retail hub, the employment hub, everything you can label it as. We then had, you know, and let's be honest, it was quite divisive, the London Gateway um, moved to the borough. You know, there was a number of local community members who, who uh, were naturally anxious. That's understandable, but undeniably a huge piece of engineering. Um, you know, it was literally engineering happening. I, I was fortunate enough to go down there at the time um, and see uh, how what they was doing with the dredging and building the the man-made berths. It was purely a, a staggering thing. And then we talk about Farrock Freeport. And to be honest with you, I think there's a big part of me which thinks actually the investment that could be realised in this borough is equally, if not bigger, than some of the larger seismic things that the borough has had uh, before. And, and some of the, the realities that will enable Furrock Council to work with partners down the estuary to realise it great, better connectivity um, is purely surreal. You know, and it's enabled us to put forward good ideas. You know, Councillor Piccolo and I have put forward... Um, you know, ideas which we hope will be listened to and hope we can make the business case for. You know, we can never say it will happen, but we're going to actively and animatedly 
campaign hard for it, that we can try and create more connectivity to the Stanhope Industrial Estate, but bypassing Wolf Road, Corringham Road and London Road, you know, a Stanford Hope problem for many years. Um, we'll be making our pitch. We've, we've volunteered our services to support that in a, in a layman's perspective, not necessarily the, the professional sense, but, but that is the kind of things that could genuinely transform. I mean, that issue has plagued my ward for 30 years. If it could happen, how transformational would that be for so many residents? And it will be the same for so many different communities and parts of our borough, um, certainly around the Stanford area, of course. Um, but yeah, from a corporate perspective, the, the, the prospects of what we can achieve are genuinely surreal. And I think your, your point's great, Mark, in terms of we've got some real big decisions to make. And a bit like where we were with investments, where we was talking and arguing about how we spend surpluses for a number of years. We clearly aren't going to be doing that anymore, but hopefully there'll be a lot more of what we are going to be talking about in terms of the, uh, the returns from the Freeport process. Um, and I'll, I'll hand back over to Carl. Yeah, yeah, I, I just come to that. It's not, it's not about that. It's about all of the borough selling this because it's confidence. We can only get that. The, the, the officers here, the, 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 the chief executive, cannot do that without the help of not just the 49 in here selling this, but we've got to help our ports sell themselves in the next two or three years to make sure they come here instead of, let me say, the other ports that will st be following us behind us. I know there's, there's one other port in Essex. We are still in Essex, even though... Thank God we're not in con like controlled by us. Our destiny is controlled by us in this room. But there is an important thing. We've got to sell the borough. And this is the important the economic regeneration strategies and the economic boom we, we put through in January. We've got, the, we've, got the, we've got to be of one. Yeah. And, um, and, it's, um, and, and I'll, I'll start with a, 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 Nick, someone else's view. But it starts from someone getting out of that taxi and walking into our new office. And thinking, we really want you here. We want that business here. We want that job here. We want that work program here, that part of work this is, and how we get work. And this is 25,000 jobs, up to 300 million pounds in business rates that we could see that the government's allowing us to keep. Like, now that is never since the mid 80s, since Liverpool was silly buggers. Like, let's talk about it. This is, this is massive. And then there's decisions that we can only do that with the, we're helping our business colleagues, helping our free, our, free, our port people to actually deliver a really great agenda and um, working together. And they're working with us on the public and they've been very working really, really well with us. And we're, they're working as a partnership with them and it's public sector working private sector to give the gains back. And we can see, I can see some great, you've mentioned there, I really want to see a brand new swimming pool, a brand new leisure centre, state of the art. I look, I look in jealousy of what Basil have got. And, um, and, then, yeah, and I want to see that. I want to see some great parks. We've got a, the, the, the Queen Elizabeth II Park in, in, uh, the Jubil the, 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 that we see in Stratford. Why haven't we got that as you go down the river? Why haven't we got a great park here? And then you've got to look at why haven't we got replacing the petrol, which is 100 years, as I said. We, we can replace that with hydrogen power. We can have hydrogen here, and we could be the, one of the first places to have hydrogen storage on the Thames and delivering 25... Again, replacing the 25% of the petrol that London uses for coming from Farrock, we can place it with 25% of the hydrogen they need to be using. These are great ideas for the next generation and um, jobs that will be well paid, good jobs for here forever. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Scott. Sorry about that. It was a um, very urgent personal matter. Um, yeah, you're absolutely quite right. We do, you know, we need to be selling the ports. We need to be selling what the ports can do. Um, you know, they are diverse ports. Um, it's, you know, yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> then freeport.com. Um, but it, it doesn't really matter, you know, what it is. We've got, as, as you say, we've got the oil port. We've got, uh, well, sorry, it seems to be the hydrogen port. Um, yeah, you know, we've got um, DP World, which, you know, as soon as the weather gets a little bit choppy. Um, out towards the uh, open estuary and stuff, that they're sending ships here because it's, you know, that they know they can get on, get it cleared, get reloaded, get off as quick as possible. Um, nowhere else can do that, and I'm, I'm not trying to take business away from anywhere else, but come to Thurrock on the Thames Freeport. Um, it will now start going out on every email. Um, this is, you know, this is, as you quite rightly say, this is life changing. Um, not just this not generation, but for the next generation. Um, and there is a big thanks to Chief Exec for the amount of work that she's done. Uh, again, yeah. millions of phone calls, um, but not one of those, shall we, shan't we? It's, well, this is where we are, this is what we're doing, this is what we need, you know, c c can, we, uh, yeah, can we find out about this? C you know, can, can you do that? This is what we're doing. It's mainly what they're doing as officers, which is brilliant. 
Um, of course, that ties in nicely with the SEE Park, SEE Park, so South East Essex Park, which, you know, as Mark said, you know, why have we got a big park? Well, again, another one of the chief executives. Um, uh, piece of work on CELEP is the SEE Park, uh, which is, you know, going to be a park all the way from Brentwood all the way through to Rochford of green and blue infrastructure. Um, so, you know, where does that money come from that? It comes from places like the Freeport, people want to offset their carbon um, their emissions by, you know, planting trees and everything else. And guess what? We've got, we really are just so well placed. But, yeah, I know I'm going to be a little bit biased, but we're probably better placed than any of the other Freeport uh, bids. So, Thames Freeport. Um, so, uh, again, apologies for him to uh, leave so quickly in return. Um, anybody else wish to speak in relation to this? No, in that case, I move to uh, the recommendations at 1.1 to 1.3 on page 292. Are they agreed? Excellent. So, uh, moving on to the next item of agenda, when you can actually find the next item on his agenda, which is item 22. Um, <laughs> uh, just for change, it's uh, Councillor Cockshaw. Uh, we do, we do have um, a Councillor Anderson here, uh, where I believe this item and the next item were discussed last night at Planning Transport Regeneration. Um, so, if there's anything you'd like to, uh, as we go through, once we've done Councillor Coxall's um, presentation, if anyone would like to ask any questions of uh, Councillor Anderson, he's ready and raring to go. So, Councillor Coxall. I, I, what I think of this, if, if I give an opening and give the colleagues and everyone out listening at home, and then I think I'll bring Councillor Anderson in to actually give a report of what happened last night, and then I can react to that and then move forward. Because we, what we do want is use ONS properly to actually challenge what we do in this room. Um, it's not a, a shop, and, a, and I think you can see that last night. We was challenged, and I was challenged on all these items went there, and Scary South was the one that was challenged the most um, at, uh, at with our chair and that, and it's good that our chair turns up at Cabinet because we make rounded decisions are decided fairly when we go through ONS. That's why the leader, when he first took control, made sure that all decisions here are not just us talking. They do go through ONS first. We all know Cabinet colleagues know the, the challenge that ONS comes, and because it only was last night, it was at that the chair come here to report back to make sure that their views are listened to. But... The, um, with the Alton to pass now, we, 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 it's really, it is some good news. I'll give the good news. We are now past what they, what, uh, what, look, what Network Rail call or GB Rail, depends when they change their name, um, becomes goes through stage grip three. Grip three is now that we are finally completed that stage and we move to the stage four, which is grip four um, of, our, of um, eight stages when we're finished. Um, so we're, it's, a, it's a milestone we've hit. We move forward now. We have a good design, better design. You heard the capital program. It needed £11 million more money to get the design that everyone liked. And we had, remember last year we chose, there were three options that we gave to here with the costs. Um, not surprising, everyone liked the most expensive option. And not surprisingly, you it was me, we went for the best option, which was that option that we had. What we have got is, remember it was an underpass and it was issues of, we don't want a smelly thing up there, that. and so it's now a wider underpass. It's reducing the amount of it. We've got the shops. We've got opportunities to actually put shops down there on the second stage of it with the no negotiations. But this is not just. This is you've got to look at this 35 seven million pounds investment here in its entire, not in its entirety. You've got to remember the 25 million pounds that we just discussed earlier. We've got the other investments that we've, we've got to retail and reusing it. The high street money coming forward. So it's a really exciting time for the high street from what I hope the Councillor Spielman was talking about, rejuvenated, not just about the thing, but we do need to connect after century, century, a long, long time, the south and the north. And I, don't want to, I want to stop talking soon about the Grey South project and the Grey... I want to just... One project. If we can deliver that, we are one Greys again. And we've got to remember going back 100 years. That, that railway line did cut it in half. There's a long, I won't go into the story of why the railway line is there, but it's not the council's fault. It's the uh, ex-dean of Thurrock that's <laughs> fault that it's there and not somewhere else. But let's go forward with this and try and say it, and I'm hoping to answer the questions that there were some budgeting questions. I think the budgeting question has come out earlier about the expansion. I think some of them think questions maybe we can answer now. 
Thank you, Councillor Coxall. Was that aimed at Councillor Anderson? Yeah, Councillor Anderson would like to contribute. Thank you, Chair, and uh, evening, Cabinet. Um, as you will be aware, the uh, the report for the Grave Underpass uh, project progress uh, came to PTR yesterday evening. And I just want to give a really, really brief uh, sort of overview uh, of the uh, sentiment expressed at committee yesterday. Um, so, before committee, uh, we, we were presented with uh, three recommendations, uh, and just really briefly, um, I will um, run through those. We had A, B, C. A related to um, the endorsement of the um, uh, project's next steps. This uh, was passed um, after a, a, a word change from endorse to uh, note. Uh, the uh, recommendation B um, was related to um, uh, the delegation of uh, relevant decision-making powers to um, the relevant director and in, in conjunction with the relevant cabinet minister Cabinet Minister, Cabinet Member, not yet. Um, th this passed with um, a small bolt-on at the end um, related to um, regular briefing notes uh, to be sent to committee. And the uh, final recommendation uh, related to the approval of the cost plan as set out in the report. Uh, this recommendation was not uh, approved yesterday evening. Um, and if I'm to sum up in one phrase, the reason uh, for the, the recommendations resulting uh, in, in, in the way that they did, um, that would probably be uh, that not, there not being enough meat on the bone of this report. It, it was felt by uh, members um, that this was uh, the case. Um, so I, what, what I do want to say, though, I think this is a really important distinction and point to make, Members did not at all express um, uh, any dissatisfaction with this uh, project overall or, or with the progression of this project. Um, the concern uh, laid in the fact that members felt as though um, there was not uh, a cost plan within the report uh, that provided enough detail in order for members to make that informed decision on whether or not to approve or disapprove um, uh, that recommendation. That's really important because it's, it's not members saying that this is a, 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 a bad project or, or, or it shouldn't progress. Uh, indeed, as, as the chair of um, PTR, I want to be un unequivocal that uh, you know investment of this scale and nature into the borough's um, civic capital is fantastic and something to be really proud of. Um, as I say, the, the issue lay in uh, what members saw as uh, uh, lacking cost plan. Um, and I think I'll, I'll just finish up by saying it was noted as well that uh, uh, this evening's cabinet uh, meeting, uh, there are pink papers. Uh, th these were not papers uh, uh, made available to committee yesterday. Um, and so it, it was felt uh, that there may be uh, some relevant information that could have been uh, present at the meeting that would have helped members to uh, uh, make those decisions. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there, Councillor Gledhill. Uh, thank you, Councillor Anderson. And before we continue, sorry, just slightly thrown off my step a little bit. Um, there is a report, I did need to make clear that there is public exempt appendices which are um, exempt and form part of this report. So we cannot refer to the information on them, but obviously we can refer to the fact that they are there. That will also apply for the next meeting. Uh, however, thank you very much, Councillor Anderson. Councillor Coxall. Yes, I was just going to cover up. It's very difficult to, to know what's in the pink paper and what's not. And I think it's something it's noting then next time, maybe we need ONS to have, uh, I, I'm confident they're elected members. And we see that as an issue I've had with the Lower Thames Crossing and the pink papers and that we're going to get negotiations with than the second part of this, maybe not so much the publics at the envelopes, the costs of the envelopes, but I think you're more concerned in the costs of where these costs are going and what you're happening, and that is only quite right. And I think we may need to move at points then to have pick close sessions with ONS and uh, briefing sessions to make sure they're fully aware and they're aware and who as elected members. And I think I understand that's cabinet and it may be difficult to do. So it's, but if Cabinet wants to discuss the pink papers, I'm happy to go into closed session. But as we've got media here on the TV, I think it, if we can keep away from it, I've tried to keep away from it. I keep thinking, am I going to say something that's in it? 
<laughs> so it's difficult. So, but look, if we can, and I take the point of that, and I think it would have been an easier meeting if we had a private session, and the ONS had a private session, a private BP session, where that is a learning that we can do and see how we can actually affair that. But I was gl glad to hear that they do care about it, and it's just that they didn't have enough information. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cox. Actually, uh, one of the things I took away from it as well was the fact that at least one member on that committee knew there were pink papers, knew it was on the pink papers, but didn't disclose it, um, which shows the, the level of confidence that we should have with all elected members that if it's on pink, it's not going out into public, uh, which is really good. I certainly know when I was chair of Overview Scrutiny, we quite regularly had um, exempt papers there um, and discussions with the cabinet members and so on. So uh, I'm, I'm sure um, as we go forward, that will be one of those regular things you'll, you'll, you'll see as chair of PTR, indeed other, other chairs may well see. And on this particular paper, are there any other questions or any questions of Councillor Anderson before I move to the recommendations on uh, page 302? No, I mean, yeah, this is a long time coming, five years. We discussed, this is one of these really good thematic um, <coughs> cabinet um, uh, meetings because, you know, some of the things we've mentioned, we've already mentioned you know, elsewhere, and you know, it's just about the improvement. As Councillor Coxwell says, of, well, in this case, Grey South, it should just be Greys. Um, you know, let, let's get rid of that. Yeah. I, I know the Leader of the Opposition and I have regularly um, said that we'd like to find the uh, officers who uh, designed um, the town centre and forgot that we'd be standing at one end of the town centre taking a draft from the river um, in like a funnel effect on, on every Remembrance Day. Um, so again, with this coming in place, it will allow the change of aspect across the whole of um, uh, the Greys area, uh, which is absolutely great. Uh, also good to see things like, as, as you said, you know, we don't want this being a particularly smelly, unpleasant place to, to walk through. Uh, so with the shops and everything else, it sort of brings us to life. Indeed, I've spoken to uh, local residents about the, the pieces that are on white paper, and they're saying, again, this is wow, this is, this is not, we knew it, Grace was going to improve, but all of this together, all of this within three or four years, this is this has gone from 0 to 60 like that, which is absolutely fantastic. So with that, um, and thank members for staying away from the uh, exempted uh, information, recommendations are um, outlined on page 302, A, B and C. Uh, the only thing to change will be be in line with the recommendations from overview scrutiny to add um, uh, the procurement for the next stage uh, set out in the program um, uh, with regular reports to go to uh, the relevant ONS committee. So are we happy with that amendment? Yep, and are we happy to agree the recommendations? Yep, 302. In that case, um, the, uh, they are all um, agreed. So we can now move on to, if you can rapidly find it, the final item of the very long evening. Um, Councillor Coxall, item 23, Grey South Delivery of Pedestrian Underpass Land Assembly. Again, I would remind people that there is part exempt information relating to, any, uh, to the report and we should steer away from disclosing any of that information. If we do need to disclose any of that information, we will need to move to exempt session and ask the members of the press and public to leave and cease the live transmission. Councillor Coxall. I will stay, try to, stay on to, on, to, on it. Uh, this is really to give uh, the delegated authority so we can move towards CPO powers. What I can honestly tell Cabinet, I am not, do not want to move to CPO powers, but it is show to commitment to the Grey South the project that we've just discussed. We need to actually show the commitment now. We need to actually stand to the landowners, the, the, uh, the, the, the to make some win-win that we start procuring and start uh, assembling the project to go to the next stage. We need to show commitment to this project and this is showing commitment that it's going to happen to the uh, owners so they can move forward and talk to us properly. Uh, the Pink Papers discuss that in more detail. If you want to talk more detail about individual uh, what we're doing now, you can, we have to do that, but I'm sure we can stay away from that and just delegate the authority, but under the authority, I don't want to move to this and go to the Secretary of State and move forward with CPO. I think we can do it without it, but it's just to make sure that we can move forward at a speed, if needed, to make sure this project happens. Apologies for that. Uh, Councillor, thank you very much, Councillor Coxall. Um, does any member want to speak before I speak on the many, many, many recommendations that are here? No. Um, I'm 100% in lockstep with Councillor Coxall in relation to the CPOs. 
we managed to not CPO the properties that were next to the council offices. Um, we did that at speed by being grown up and having proper conversations with the owners and occupiers. Um, those owners and occupiers have, have, have moved elsewhere where they wanted to carry on businesses. Um, I know one's very successful uh, in Ockenden and Derwent Parade. Um, uh, again, we've, we've not just said, thank you very much, off you go. I, you know, we've been helping him in, indeed up until very recently to ensure his business will uh, survive and thrive, um, as we've done with, with, with indeed uh, others. Um, we did it there. I cannot see the reason why we can't do it again. CPO is just going to add months and months, years, or 18 months, whatever, to the process. It adds unnecessary pain and suffering. It adds unnecessary costs in, in relation to uh, legal costs going through the High Court and proving everything we need to do. Is, it needs to be done. Let's face it, I think we all know this needs to be done. The shop owners know it needs to be done. The landowners know it needs to be done. New River know it needs to be done. And everybody knows it needs to be done. Let's get it done. So let's not have to rely on the CPO, but it's great to have it here should we need it. So, any other questions or statements in relation to this? There are 12 recommendations, which I'm not going to read out, uh, found at pages 314 to 315 at 1.1 through to 1.9.3. Uh, are they all agreed? agreed. Excellent. I thought you were going to say, I don't agree that one, just to make me read them out. Um, in that case, um, I'd like to thank you all for this evening. It's been a very long, actually probably one of the longest cabinets we've had, one of the largest cabinet papers we've had to 23 items. Um, apologies for having to take a, a bit of a, you know, a personal call there. Um, so with that, I'm going to call the meeting to an end at 21.26. I'd like to thank everybody. Councillor Mainly, what's the score?